Hey everybody, this is Roberto Blake helping you create something awesome today. Welcome back to the channel. Today we are going to be doing another YouTube analytics deep dive. I'm going to be showing you all of my YouTube analytics data that I've accumulated over the years. So we're going to be diving heavily into analytics. We're going to be going into the advanced mode of YouTube analytics. And we're going to basically be looking at a lot of my lifetime data, but we're also going to be looking at specifically the data around how I went from zero to 100,000 subscribers. And we're going to dive even into how um, in 14 months I was able to go from uh, 20,000 subscribers to 100,000 subscribers uh, and how I accomplished that. We're also going to talk a little bit about some of the new updates and changes to YouTube. And this is important because uh, there are new changes to YouTube shorts. There are new changes to YouTube copyright. There are new monetization policies. There are a lot of things for us to talk about. So we're, we're going to be getting into um, a lot of different things here. I'm going to try my best to also keep up with your chats, especially your super chats. And we'll go over the data. We'll answer some of your questions via super chat. Um, Great shout out, by the way, to all the channel members who are showing up. I also put this in subscribers only mode. One, that'll help us grow subscribers on the stream. Number two, it will also help with spam and getting rid of the spam. So uh, that's something that I think is going to help dramatically. And I think it's going to be a really great stream, everybody. So I'm really looking forward to this. I just want to say hi to my good friend, uh, Melly Cinco. Thank you for sending me the special celebration cookie for my new book, Create Something Awesome. Uh, shout out to Doc Rock, who's always been supporting me and who is a fellow speaker at People of Video. Shout out to uh, Doug Hewson. Shout out to OG Chad Salzberg, old school Vayner Nation. What's up, my man? And we have a bunch of other people. Uh, if I see any of the OGs, I'll definitely be shouting you out. Uh, we've got uh, she's she fires in the stream. Thank you. I think you became a channel member recently. So let's go ahead and get into some of the analytics because I know that's a lot of what um, many of you came for. And so um, let's go ahead and take a look. Specifically, let's go into advanced mode. Uh, I know a lot of you actually have trouble reading analytics, so I want to um, help you a little bit with that and help you understand how you can better read analytics. Something I'm going to do specifically, though, is we're going to go into, we're not going to worry so much about views. We're going to look at two really important metrics. We're going to look at my subscriber count. We're also going to look at the number of uh, videos published. And so you can see there's a lot of data here in the advanced mode of YouTube analytics, like a lot. Uh, I am going to zoom in a little bit. I think that will help um, with more of you being able to see this. We don't really need to see watch hours. So I'm going to hide that metric in the chart. And then I'm going to try to get everything uh, that does matter to be bigger. Um, I don't mind you guys seeing revenue, but it's really not important for this conversation. We're really only going to look at uh, videos published, uh, views, and subscribers. So we're going to basically, to make it easier for you to read, we're going to hide everything that doesn't matter. Um, I don't mind showing you this data. It's just that it's not important, and you need to learn how to read analytics. And so what we're going to do is we're going to make everything bigger to make this easier to see and easier to understand for everybody on the stream. So I hope this helps a little bit more. Um, that's too big because now we can't see everything. So let me just shrink that up a little bit. Great. And I wonder if we should do a bar chart. I wonder if that, no, that bar chart's not really helping. We need a line chart after all, but I think instead of daily, maybe if we see monthly, yeah, 
I think that I think that adds a little bit more clarity. And YouTube uh, doesn't have um, a lot of data, but uh, like because sometimes it loses data. But I didn't really start publishing videos until like August of 2013, so it doesn't really matter too much. So you can see for the lifetime of my channel that I've made about 1,600 videos, 37 million views, 565,000 subscribers, and growing. And what I want to do is this is showing you the lifetime growth of my channel. Uh, this shows you the videos I got the most subscribers from. I want to take you guys back in time. Back in my day. I want to take you guys back in time. So I'm going to take all of you back to... I'm going to take all of you back to 2013. We're going to go to um, August... We're going to go to like... Yeah, we're going to go to like August 1st of 2013. And we're going to look at that all the way to... Uh, 2016 and I want to just show you this because it will give you perspective on uh, everything YouTube to understand this so this is a three-year period that we're going to go to so we're going to go to from August 1st all the way through August uh, 1st 2013 through 2016 I published about 800 videos so that's half the videos that I've ever made right there and that's how I got my first 125,000 subscribers. So you can see for yourself, this is exactly what it took for me to go from zero to 100,000 subscribers. Thank you, She Fires. Uh, you did become a channel member. Awesome. Glad to see it. You love to see it. Um, Alyssa, I haven't seen your um, stuff come through my system. So I'll double check the emails, but I haven't seen anything from you come through my system. So I'll take a look, um, but you may want to send an email to info at Roberto Blake um, and let me know what email and what info you signed up with and what date you signed up and for what services, because then I'll check on it. But I haven't seen anything from you come through my system, but I also was at Vid Summit all week, so it could be backlogged, but I'll take a look or I'll have somebody on my team look at it for you. So anyway, getting back to the data. So these are the videos published. These are also the videos that gave me the most subscribers. What you'll notice is that I did not go viral and no big video did it for my channel. Like it was all incremental. These are the top 50 video results. And so what you can see from this is if you look at it, um, if you look at like say the top 20 videos of mine, it was the top 20 videos of mine that gave me most of my subscribers, even in the early days. So this is how I got to 100,000 subscribers. The other thing is, um, it wasn't my YouTube help videos. If you take a look, I wasn't really doing many YouTube help videos. I did something on how to get your first 100 subscribers. I obviously had already had well over 100 subscribers when I made that video. So I made that video in January of uh, 2015. I'm sure I had like 30,000 subscribers before I ever told anyone how to grow on YouTube. I had 30,000 subscribers before I ever told anyone to grow on YouTube. Most of my stuff was graphic design related. It was uh, remote work related, video editing, photography. Um, I made a couple of YouTube help videos, but again, I already had 30, 50,000 subscribers on non YouTube related content by then. Um, I was doing tutorial videos like uh, Premiere Pro video editing. That got me um, some subscribers. So if you really look at, I didn't get that much out of the YouTube help videos. I maybe got 5,000 subscribers out of 125,000 subscribers out of YouTube help content, and that is it. I know everyone likes to say so much, oh, the easiest way to grow on YouTube is to make videos about how to grow on YouTube. But that's not what I did. A lot of people take it for granted. You can see for yourself that I got a whole silver play button mostly off of completely unrelated content focused around graphic design and focused around um, Photoshop tutorials, video editing tutorials. Um, this is what I was doing for a very long time. This was my old profession. I used to be a freelancer and I actually made the money during my YouTube career editing other people's videos, doing graphic design work for them, building websites, doing photography, shooting weddings. That's how I made my money. I didn't make money off of YouTube for years. And when I did, a multi-channel work, work an MCN, took half of my money anyway. Like, took half of my money. 
like 50% of my AdSense, which a little bit of it it was, uh, was taken by an MCN. So what I had to do to grow on YouTube to get to 100,000 subscribers was I had to I had to get almost 10 million views. I got um, 7.6 million views. So I did a little a lot better than a 1% conversion rate of views turning into subscribers. So like that uh, makes a difference. And I had to publish 826 videos, 826 videos. Um, so we got Doc Rock with a super chat. Thank you, Doc Rock, for the $20 super chat. Aloha, buying somebody a book on me. Yeah, he's talking about my new book, uh, Create Something Awesome, linked in the description. You can also check it out on Amazon. You just type in Create Something Awesome or type in my name. Uh, the book is out. It is uh, 15 bucks, just 15 bucks. It's a print book. It's a real book. Uh, it took me forever to publish it. And so um, that's out. It's one month old and it's a Amazon bestseller. Um, I think it's still number one or number two in the podcasting category. So that's actually pretty dope. So I would really love it if all of you in the stream, there's about um, almost 150 of you watching the stream right now. At, during the stream or after the stream, if you guys could go to Amazon and buy my book, you can either buy the print version and own it or you can buy the Kindle version. The audio will come out next month, I think. Um, if you know the 150 or so of you watching could buy my book, that would be awesome and it would really help me out. And it's, I think it's also a really solid book. So like I was saying, um, to get to 100,000 subscribers from zero, you can see exactly what I did. And I'll tell you what worked for me because uh, a lot of people do not uh, realize this. So most of the videos I made that grew me, um, if we look at it, I'm going to specifically pull up something because I have an advanced feature called groups. And so I have, uh, I have this thing called groups. And let's see. I know, I think, I thought I had made a new group category recently. Hang on a second. Let me refresh this. As I know, I know there is a way to, ah, here we go. So if I click on this group, th I found 100 of my design videos. And so um, let's see, that's just for that time period. Let me turn that to lifetime. And so um, for the design videos, we know that off of 100 of them that I specifically picked out, it got me like almost 60,000 subscribers. And then if I go specifically to um, tutorials, the tutorial videos got me, how many subscribers did tutorials get me? Does it know? About another 29,000. And then we got videos about money. How many? How much did videos about money? Videos about money got me 75,000 of my subscribers, 75,000. So like I said, it's not just the YouTube videos. I know a lot of you signed up for the YouTube help videos. I know a lot of you did, but that's not everybody in my audience, which is also why not every video gets like X amount of views. But what I want to explain by showing you guys this is one, these are advanced features and analytics you can use to understand your content better. So when you make video groups like this, like I have these different videos, and it helps me understand my content. Like this one, it has the most recent 50 videos. And so what I can see is the most recent 50 videos I made, the most recent 50 videos I made got me 26,000 subscribers. So this is an advanced feature that really helps you better understand what's happening with your YouTube videos. What this also tells me, what this also tells me in particular, is if the last 50 of my videos got me um, 26,000 subscribers, if I was making 150 videos a year, then I'd probably grow by over 100,000 um, you know, subscribers because I haven't made quite 50 videos in the last year. I've made less than that, unfortunately, I think. Uh, but if I were to do 150 videos in a year, 
like back in the old days, I think that I would have been growing by over a hundred, 150,000 during the year. But during the pandemic, I slowed down for mental health reasons. And so I, I would be closer to 800,000 or a million subscribers if I did not slow down during the pandemic. Uh, but you know, you have to do what you have to do and you have, sometimes you need a break, but it does tell me, um, you know, what is going on with the channel. And so you can see individual videos that produce subscribers. And the thing is, if I duplicate the most successful videos, you could see that that will tremendously grow the channel. Now, what I want to do here is I'm going to compare this to a different time period. I'm going to um, go to I'm going to go to 2016 August, and then I'm going to compare that through 2019. And what um, I consider to be kind of my prime of growth in YouTube. And so during that three year period, I grew by during that three year period, I grew by 292 subscribers in three years. So I grew by about 300,000 subscribers by three years in my prime. So I know that in my prime, if I make a certain amount of content and I make certain videos, I know that it's possible in a three year period based on volume, focus, quality, quantity, balance. This is um, from back in 2016 through 2019. So it's a previous three year cycle versus say 2020 through 2022, right? It's a different three year cycle. So it took me three years to get to 100,000 subscribers, but another three years gave me another 300,000 and took me to over 400,000 subscribers. So you can see what slowing down on your content does. It's like, it really hurts the growth by comparison because if we compare, if we compare, um, you know, 2019, you know, we go, let's say we go to August 1st, we go to, uh, 2020 and we compare that to through August 1st, 2022, um, that's another three year cycle and we can compare the growth. And you can see the difference. The difference is, oh, wait, I have to take it off of, um, hang on. I have to take it off of just the group setting and it would have to go through all. So it would be compare selected time period to period over period. Uh, we have to year over year, same period last year. No, we'll do it. Um, all right, so what, what we're doing here is this. We're comparing the previous period of my first three years on YouTube to the three years that followed it, and you can see the difference. That's a massive difference um, of 124,000 subscribers versus gaining another 300,000. So that was the difference. Um, and then if we compare this to, let's say... Um, like we said, we'll compare to 2022, um, compare August 2020, 20 through 2022. So we'll compare the next three years after that, 2020, 2021, 2022. Okay. So if we compare the difference here, it's uh, similar to when I got started. And, but it's like the volume, making less videos mattered a lot. Making less videos mattered a lot um, in terms of the growth. And so when you compare it, it's not even close. So if I had done what I had done um, in 2016 through 2019, which was just make a crap ton of content, just make a crap ton of content. If I had done that in 2020 uh, through the pandemic, if I had done that during the pandemic, I would be at basically close to a million subscribers right now because um, I'd have another like 200,000 subscribers plus. So I'd be at like 700,000, 800,000, something like that. Um, so you can see the difference that like a lack of publishing does because if um, we use the difference in 
Um, we went by subscribers. What if we go by videos published? You're going to see a huge difference. So the difference was 500 videos versus 111 videos in a three-year period. 500 videos in a three-year period versus 111 videos in a year three-year period. And the difference between the growth was 300,000 subscribers versus 100,000 subscribers worth of growth. So let this be a lesson to everybody here in terms of how much, when people tell you quality over quantity, I can tell you that in the last three years, I've made far superior quality videos to the previous three years, and it's not even close. The video quality was far superior, but turning down that video quality, uh, sorry, but um, turning up that video quality, but publishing one fifth of the videos resulted in one third of the views. So, uh, and the quality improved by more than double. The quality of my content improved by more than double in those three years, but the quantity went down by 80%. So if there's a debate about quality over quantity and you're not a viral content creator, I hope that the data speaks for itself. I hope that the numbers speak for itself, ladies and gentlemen. Consistency will get you the most results consistency will get you the most results because I showed you the publishing data in terms of the amount of content made. And then I showed you the subscriber data. Let's look at the view data. So the view data is 20,000 views versus, sorry, 20 million views, 20 million views versus 6 million views. So I made, uh, you know, one fifth of the content, about one fifth of the content. And as a result, I got, um, you know, maybe 25% of the views. So it's right around there, but the quality improved quality in terms of quality versus quantity. Once you start, once you stop making videos that are objectively not high quality and you can make decent enough videos, if you can make decent enough videos, make making more of the decent videos grows you more over a consistent period of time, even years than just upping the quality because I, I know that I increased the quality more than double to like by every year afterward. And I slowed down on the quality, sorry, on the quantity. I slowed down the quantity. I upped the quality and the results are in. It didn't grow me more. It theoretically grew me more per like video arguably, but not really because the more videos I made, the more chances I had to hit because it was about what people were interested in. It wasn't really a quality thing. Now, the difference is I think that that difference might be education versus entertainment content, if I'm being honest with you. If you make entertainment, you know, if you um, make entertainment content, in some cases, quality might matter more. In some cases, if you're doing entertainment content, higher levels of quality maybe will get you more. But that's more if you're making viral style content or content that could go viral with a broad audience. If you don't have a super broad audience, if you don't have a super broad audience, I do not think that quality will do more for you than quantity if you're going to increase in an area. But I think you should slowly increase quality over time. And I think quantity helps do that sharpens the saw. So I think making more videos gives you more chances for YouTube to help you discover an audience. I think it gives people more content to binge watch, more content to share. So the, like quality isn't always the best, not always. Um, but I don't think that it, if, if you're going to do something that's entertainment, the quality is not going to be over editing it. The quality might be more personality driven. So I think personality, personality, um, you know, really is the game when it comes to YouTube. But, you know, sometimes you cannot be as consistent as you like. I mean, mental health matters. Uh, Roxy uh, Beckel says kind of messed up by missing the pandemic swing. Regret it, but soldiering on. Yeah, I, I missed the same thing. Given the pandemic, it's possible I'd be at a million subscribers because there were more people watching more things. So if I published more things, it might have gone up and up and up. So I totally get it. Um, a lot of creators grew from zero in the pandemic. Some people grew from zero to a million. Um, 
Captain Ruggles says, like the gaming niche, quantity is good with quality over time. Yeah, as long as the quality is good enough. Because I'm not saying you have to make junk content. I'm saying that you could put your heart and soul into the editing and making perfect videos, and then it could still underperform. If anything, the thumbnail would matter the most. If anything, the topic title and thumbnail matter the most. So again, I'm just giving it to you straight. I'm just showing you what the data says. And now to make this more, to make stuff that's more relatable for small YouTubers, what I have to do is I have another channel that I can show you. I have a smaller um, channel that I've been doing some stuff for recently. Um, for more than for more than 50 days, uh, we've posted about 50 videos. So we've been posting a bunch of videos straight through on my highlights channel, um, which I'm not going to link to because the game is we've been getting pure and data from the YouTube algorithm. We've been getting all these views and all these subs purely from YouTube algorithm and no um, links or promotion, no sharing the videos or anything like that. So um, for about uh, 50 days, we've like posted more than 50 videos. And what we did was this. Um, this channel is um, like somewhat on its way to monetization. Within 12 months, it'll be monetized. We've been doing this since August. So we posted basically every day since August. So it's more than 50 videos. I'm just saying it's 50 because that's a rounded number. And so uh, we've been doing this. And what I can show you in the analytics is we're at 500, uh, more than 500 watch hours. So we're an eighth of the way there, almost halfway on subscribers. And we've only done it since the beginning of August. What I will show you in analytics is basically every video on this channel gets an over 50% retention rate most of them being 60 or 75 and we don't even make thumbnails all of this is automated youtube thumbnails all of the traffic is from the youtube algorithm i mean look at our retention rates look at these retention graphs just look at that isn't that crazy in terms of retention graphs and none of these are youtube shorts this is all short form one to four minute videos and so we get all of our traffic pretty much from browse. The suggested videos are not from uh, big YouTubers. It's literally just from the individual videos itself. So we have our own channel page, browse features doing most of the work. So all of this is YouTube algorithm doing the work. This is all YouTube algorithm, not even search, not even search. This is a completely new channel. This is a fresh new channel. And we don't even edit these videos. All it is is clips of my speaking engagements, a few rant videos, um, and some interviews. And we don't even let we let YouTube pick the thumbnails. We let YouTube pick the thumbnails. And so that's the crazy part. The crazy part is we let YouTube pick the thumbnails. Um, and so this video is from a week ago. And look at these views. This is a week. This is a completely fresh channel doesn't even have a thousand subscribers and it's getting 800 views all from the YouTube algorithm, all from the YouTube algorithm. That's it. Um, and look at that. 87% is from YouTube recommendations. YouTube homepage is all of it. And we're not even making thumbnails. So that's the thing. So now imagine that this is a YouTube channel where we made thumbnails. Imagine we were pasting these one to four minute videos and we actually edited them and we posted thumbnails. And again, we have massive retention rates. Look at the retention rate for this uh, video. The audience retention is about 50% on this video. Um, so look at that. We have some drop off, but we have people watching all the way to the end and it's a three minute video. And so this is really good. It has a, almost 50% retention. So that's very good. Um, you know, the click through rate varies. We're not really that worried about it as it reaches a larger audience, click through rate changes. But again, this is almost to a thousand views, no push, all YouTube algorithm on a completely new channel. So I don't ever want to hear people saying YouTube doesn't help small YouTubers. YouTube doesn't push small YouTubers. YouTube suppresses small YouTubers. I don't ever want to hear it because again, 80% of the traffic is YouTube recommendations, almost 90%. This has almost 1,000 views uh, on a 400 subscriber channel. So you have the data. This is clean data. And you also cannot say that YouTube, when you post a new video, oh, I don't want to post a new video. I'm going to burn out my subscribers. Oh, I don't want to post a new video. YouTube's going to suppress my old video. 
It, it we've been uploading every day since August. We've been uploading every day at August. And you know what we've been doing? We've been uploading basically every day at 12 noon. Every day, 12 noon, we do a new highlight on the Roberto Blake Highlights channel. And we're not even, it's not even views coming from mostly subscribers. And this is pure YouTube algorithm traffic. Pure YouTube algorithm traffic in terms of um, returning viewers. It's mostly new viewers. You can see for yourself, the data doesn't lie. It's mostly um new viewers because we have uh, 3.5k unique viewers um less than a thousand uh returning viewers we've been getting subscribers on this so that's good um let's see uh we're not even getting our views from the notification so that's not doing anything look at this most of this is from non-subscribers so if we go in here and we go to views and we see views um Non-subscribers make up um, probably the overwhelming majority. 74%, 73% of our views are from non-subscribers. Let's look at the last 90 days. You're like, okay, that's the last 28 days. Let's look at the last 90 days. 86% of all total views, non-subscribers. Non-subscribers, ladies and gentlemen. And this is a completely fresh YouTube channel. Look, you can see when we started posting in August. Look at that. Started posting in August, and all the traffic is from the YouTube algorithm. It's not, you know, from promoting the videos. It's nothing like that. It's all pure YouTube. So this is a new channel. Less than a thousand subscribers. Been operating this channel August and September. So two months. Two months. That's it. So what we can do over if that's two months then we're definitely probably going to hit monetization in under 12 months. Uh, we post daily videos to this highlights channel. And so this is going to do very well. This is going to continue to green subscribers. And again, look at the average view durations. Look at the, look at the average uh, percentage viewed. Um, we're, we're killing it with this. And this is on content that is one to four minutes long. That's it. Content that's one to four minutes long. If we did the same thing with content that was four to eight minutes long, we get the watch time a lot quicker and get to monetization. So the thing is, it can be done on a new channel from scratch. I'm not saying you have to daily upload, by the way. I'm not saying that at all. That's the strategy we're using. But you don't have to daily upload. And we're using this largely for data collection purposes. And I'm using it for a case study. So we've been doing that. So we're not even making super long videos to game the algorithm or any of that. And this is... Um, what we're doing now I can tell you what gave us these high retention rates too because uh, you guys saw for yourself the retention rates are absurd um, we get these like massive retention rates and I can tell you why we are able to get these like 65 and 75 percent retention rates and keep more than half the audience watching to the end and the secret that we uh, came across is these videos start abruptly and they end abruptly these videos start abruptly, they end abruptly, and they're engaging. And there's really no edits in these videos. There's like, it's all just me on like stages. So it's high quality. It's high quality content in terms of the production value. The editing is not, there's no editing. It's just audio, video, and lighting. All we did is the basics. Audio, video, and lighting is the basics. These are just segments from live interviews and speaking engagements in person. So it's in-person engaging content, fly on the wall content. It's one to four minutes long. There are no thumbnails. It's all screen caps. There's no thumbnails. It is exactly what the video is. So it's no clickbait. It starts abruptly. It ends abruptly. All the views are driven by topic and title only. We took timing out of the equation because we upload at 12 noon every day, uh, Eastern Standard Time. And we took thumbnails out of the equation to say, can we reduce YouTube down to basically being, are people interested in a topic and a title? And we found out that that's all it takes. We found out that people will click a video purely on the topic and the title. We are not even gaming thumbnails. If we used thumbnail optimization and we cared about making trending stuff, because we're not even trying to trend, all we're doing is just what did what did Roberto say that's a good sound bite? What did Roberto say that's a good sound bite? All we are doing is making the titles off of what did Roberto say that's a good sound bite. That's it. So when 
So this is like bare bones content. And this is what we can accomplish with bare bones content. So it's a really good case study. It's a really good data test. Um, and I'm really happy with what we learned from that. Uh, let's answer some questions in the super chat. Um, let's see. Are the retention rates great because they are highlights and are short in duration? Possibly, but I can get 50% um, view durations on my edited videos that are long form as well that are over 10 and 12 minutes long. So um, it's still possible to get very high retention rates, even on long form content and things that aren't highlights. If you um, do it properly, we do the same thing with a lot of my tutorial videos as well, because it's exactly um, what people want. Um, please drop a thumbs up to show appreciation for our host. Yes, please, please, please <laughs> drop a, a thumbs up. That would be greatly, greatly appreciated. Um, it does help out. Um, Jeremy asks, um, and let me switch cameras real quick. So Jeremy asks, Roberto, what about regional geographic facts, for example, having the same channel, guitar, music, cover, no speaking in the U.S. or Switzerland, Europe? I'm wondering if the YouTube recommendations differently. I don't think that it's recommending differently entirely based on where you are, but you could check your analytics data. But if because if you're doing cover songs of U.S. music, it should reach an English speaking audience regardless of where they live. So it should be U.S., Canada and the like places um, like that. Um, toxic tangent says, cause the actual content is good. Yes. That helps tremendously. Uh, JC five k says that's impressive, but you are famous on this platform. If you're from Joe Smo, it wouldn't look like that because there's no prior record. No one has ever seen Joe Smo, but they've seen Roberto Blake. Actually, that's not true. And I'll tell you a fact. Joe Schmo doesn't need to make Joe Schmo content because let you're right. No one gives a crap about Joe Schmo. Joe Schmo could make iPhone content. iPhone is more famous than Roberto Blake. So it doesn't matter. You get better views. Like, do you realize what would happen if I had just done the same experiment and done Star Wars? No one gives a shit about Roberto Blake. Trust me on that. Believe it. No one cares. No one cares that I'm Roberto Blake. I promise you. And I'm not famous. I'm not famous. I don't have a million subscribers. I ain't famous. I ain't important. Facts. If I just made Star Wars content, you know who's more famous than Roberto Blake? Darth Vader. Luke Skywalker. Emperor Palpatine, Kylo Ren, Ray Skywalker, Finn, Poe, all of them are more famous than Roberto Blake, and it's not even close. All I'd have to do is do the same thing and make Star Wars content, and I would be on my way to monetized YouTube. All I'd have to do, it's iPhone season. I could have just made daily videos about the iPhone, the Pixel 7. I could just, tech. it's Techtober, it's Techtober. Someone could just make really good content that's one to eight minutes long every day. Uh, around the, the latest gadgets during tech season, and they would grow faster than me being Roberto Blake because it doesn't matter. And if they actually did good titles, good thumbnails, because again, I didn't even make thumbnails. I didn't make thumbnails. You could make, you know one another thing you could do? You could just talk about all the famous celebrity scandals and you would get more views. You would grow more than that. You could be daily gossip bomb. You could be the gossip bomb and you could just talk about all these celebrities that are much more important than me that have scandals right now, and you would get a hell of a lot more views, a hell of a lot more subs, a hell of a lot more watch time. I promise you. So Joe Schmo's problem isn't that he's a nobody. Joe Schmo's problem is that he can talk about someone much more famous than me. He can talk about a product everyone loves. He can talk about a franchise everyone loves. You realize if I did the exact same thing and covered House of the Dragon right now, if I had uploaded 30 to 50 videos and it was all the characters in great houses of House of the Dragon, as a fresh new YouTuber, I would have more subs and more views because more people know about House of the Dragon, more people care about House of the Dragon, more people are searching for that. I could just talk Rhaenys Targaryen, uh, Rhaenyra Targaryen. I could talk about um, Lord Corliss. I could talk about um, Alicent Hightower, and I would get much more views than talking about Roberto Blake. I promise you, it's not that difficult. So again, you want to talk about prior record, all someone has to do, and I keep telling all of you this, make content around things people actually want to watch. And if you're Joe Smo, no one cares about you. I agree. But no one cared about Roberto Blake either. That's why I never made content about Roberto Blake when I started. You saw the data. I started making videos about Photoshop, 
and Premiere Pro and career development in web and graphic design and photography and about Nikon cameras, Canon cameras, and Sony cameras. Why? Because people care about all those things. They don't care about Roberto Blake. I promise you. I promise you they don't care about Roberto Blake. Not a significant number. Not the number you think. I am not famous. So it doesn't matter. You can make content about things that are actually relevant and people are actually relevant, not little old irrelevant me, and you'll get plenty more views. It doesn't matter that it's a Roberto Blake Highlights channel at all. YouTube has a stronger record of every franchise, Harry Potter, Game of Thrones, Star Wars. You want to get views on YouTube? You want to be a big YouTuber? Talk about that instead of talking about yourself and you'll get views. It's almost a guarantee at this point. That's just facts. It's trending right now. There's a new Star Wars short a show, Andor. There's a new Star Wars short, Andor. There's going to be a Star Wars YouTuber who gets to 10,000 subscribers in two months talking about Andor right now. I promise you. So it, it, it doesn't matter that I'm Roberto Blake. I didn't even use the advantages of Roberto Blake other than, oh, good footage. That's all I used, good footage. So, you know, it doesn't really matter. I get where you're coming from, but again, it doesn't matter. Someone having an opinion about Star Wars will get more views than me. It's just facts. Someone having an opinion about Game of Thrones will just get more views than me. It's just facts. Um, Bridal Sewing Technique says, how would these highlight videos do on your main channel? Wouldn't it just stack more views on what you're already doing? Probably not. To be honest, it probably wouldn't. Doug Houston is right. Topic matters. I keep telling you all, topic, title, thumbnail, you know, that's what really matters. We took thumbnails out of the equation. We took timing out of the equation. And as for the topics, all they were were just my hot takes. So the thing is, the reason those videos do well is because people care about influencers and commentary on that, and they care about these platforms. But people care more about a lot of things. That's a very small market. To be honest, it's a very small market of people who care about that. Um, so, you know, it's just facts. Learning technology with Frank. We care, Roberto. Thank you, Frank. I appreciate it. Um, Pavlo says, hi, Roberto. How can I reach you? Do you have a Klubi account? I don't have a Klubi account. I don't know what Klubi is. Uh, I have a Twitter and that, um, you know, Matt, that works. I have a Twitter. Um, you should do Star Wars content. You should have gone to Celebration. Yeah, one of these days, one of these days, I don't know when, one of these days, I'm going to start a faceless Star Wars YouTube channel and y'all are not going to know about it and you're not going to know what the name is. I'm just going to be a faceless Star Wars YouTuber one of these days, probably within the next year. Within the next year, I'm going to start a faceless Star Wars channel and then all of the excuses will fade away into oblivion. When I start a faceless Star Wars channel, all the excuses will go away into oblivion and fade into the night and everybody can stop crying and whinging and whining because I will start a faceless Star Wars channel. It'll be an entertainment channel because Star Wars is entertainment kind of, but also to kind of be education style because it'll be talking Star Wars facts and Star Wars lore and all the things. So I'll start a Star Wars channel. It'll be an entertainment franchise channel. It'll be regular YouTuber -y content, YouTuber -y content. Woo, right? It'll be a faceless channel, right? And when I do that faceless Star Wars channel at exactly the right time, and I do that faceless Star Wars channel, and then all the data starts rolling in, and it's another new YouTube channel that's getting views without me promoting it, without me linking out anywhere, without me doing anything but best practices and just making solid content and the channel grows, which it will, no one will be able to say anything because then it's not me leveraging my name as Roberto Blake. It's nothing but me leveraging my knowledge of YouTube and it's just a fresh YouTube channel that is growing off of a popular franchise. And the thing is, that's people's problem. People want to grow off of, um, you know, they haven't built anything or done something that has like made them build a reputation and then they want attention and then they're shocked they don't grow. Most people cannot grow for daily vloggers because as daily vloggers, because they're not doing an adventure filled life. Casey Neistat and Ryan Trahan take people on adventures and wild rides. That's why their content works. If you don't have something interesting as an adventure, then daily vlog content doesn't work. You know? Um, and 
if and so it's the domain of people who live exciting lives. If you have expertise, an education channel can grow. If you're passionate about something, sometimes if you do entertainment, but you tie it to a franchise that you're passionate about, you can grow. So those those are things that would grow you. Um, the nerdy entrepreneur says, my House of the Dragon video is getting me views. Oh, there you go. Uh, somebody says, you're 100% right. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, what camera do I use? This camera is the Sony A6600. This camera is the uh, Sony ZV-E10, which in my mind is actually superior in many ways. Uh, this one has a cheaper lens. This lens on here is maybe a two or $300 lens. It's a 20 millimeter crop sensor lens. The lens on here is my 35 millimeter G Master, which is why it's buttery smooth in the background. And so that's, that's a lot. Um, that's very expensive. That lens, I think, is maybe $1,400, $1,500. But the thing is, um, this entire setup is cheaper than just that lens because the Sony ZV-E10 is like $700. And this lens is uh, like two or $300. And then you could put a really good Deity microphone or something or a Sony microphone on there. And so you're dumbing under $1,200, $1,500, and you'd be perfect. You would have a perfect camera for vlogging, filming, live streaming, anything you want to do, talking head, uh, uh, could shoot in 4K. It's all you need, and it's it, you never have to upgrade for a very, very long time, and it would be quality. So um, could highly recommend that. Um, yes, your channel name is a hashtag could make your uh, videos more searchable, but I, I don't really focus on it because uh, as it is on that new channel, I'm not even getting search views. It's all homepage views. Just remember, I'm optimizing now for the YouTube homepage. One of the things I'll show you in analytics is that um, I'm optimizing everything on all these channels around the YouTube homepage. I can show you, I have a faceless music channel. I just haven't uploaded to this faceless music channel in forever, but I have a faceless music channel, Zenbuster Music. And so the thing is, I have a lot of data. I've, I've done a lot of different things. I have a faceless YouTube channel. Problem is, I've only uploaded once in the last 30 days to this channel, and I've only uploaded once in... I haven't uploaded hardly in uh, six months to this channel. So if we look at um, the lifetime, like I should be monetized on this channel, but I missed it um, last year by like 200 hours. And then it went back to starting over. So I had to start over because, or close to starting over because I missed it. Because if you look at the monetization I'm at um, on this channel, it's more than halfway, but I was like really close. I was only 200 watch time hours short on this faceless music channel that I use. This faceless music channel that I have where it's like, oh, you know, it's not using Roberto Blake's face. Like um, now in the last 28 days, it's going 100 watch hours. That may not seem impressive, but that's without no uploads, though. No uploads. We still got watch time. So that is actually more impressive um, in the last 365 days. But again, resets happen. And sometimes uh, some live streams, like if they go way too long, if they go over 12 hours, they don't count. Um, but this is the last 365 days. So you can see what I mean about how close we get to the watch time requirements uh, with 3.5K there. Um, but yeah. Um, this channel is a faceless music channel. It has, I think it has what, 1800, like, yeah, not let, like less than 2000 subscribers, um, long form, super long form videos and beats and stuff like that. Um, copyright free, you know, one hour loops, 12 hour loops, all kinds of craziness, 10 hour loops, yet yeah, hella watch time. Um, hella watch time. Look at the watch time on a lot of these. So you can see that you can see the strategy behind this. This one is a watch time generator. I do know how to if I actually do upload like another 50 videos uh, to 60 videos that are the right videos. If I use long videos on this uh, for um, a couple of months, like to end out the year, if I put like 50, 60 videos up, 
definitely if I put up 100 videos and they're all loops, if they're all mixtapes, if I put like 50 to 100 mixtapes up, which I can do for this channel pretty easily, then this channel gets monetized. And so then we'll have the music data on monetization for this. But um, yeah, but you can see for yourself, like this gets watch time. This works. Um, in terms of views and reach for the last 365 days, again, mostly I haven't posted in months. I haven't posted in six months. So since I haven't posted in six months, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's a little harder, but it still is getting hella views and watch time. So there is that most of it comes from, um, we look at, uh, subscribers versus non-subscribers, I think it's mostly non-subscribers. Um, let's see. Where are the analytics for this video? Oh, this one was a live stream that went too long. Uh, let's see. Oh, this let's do let's look at the analytics around this one. So this one has almost uh, 400 watch hours by itself. Um, so this one has almost 400 watch hours by itself. So basically, if I make a couple of these, if I make like 10 of these, that, that's the answer. The answer is I make 10 of these, I get monetized. That's the answer. So um, there's that. Engagement. Uh, let's see. It's a little different for super long videos like this because, again, it's 10 hours. It's a 10 hour video. So, not subscribed. Most of the watch time is not subscribed. Um, wow, I was really surprised that demographics being so skewed in one direction. United States. And then the rest of it is worldwide because it's music with no lyrics. So, it's music with no lyrics. So, again, this faceless music channel can get almost 400 watch hours on a single track as long as it's a 10 hour um session you know for like so the sleep music i think we specifically have a video that is designed around sleep let me look and see if uh what the data is on that video so there's yeah 10 hours of lo-fi to help you sleep what was the watch time on this this one's almost 100 hours of watch time by itself so you see if i have videos that can get one to 400 hours of watch time it's just a matter of making 50 of those 10 hour sessions for sleep, relax, anxiety. And if I make 10 of those and they're getting like, you know, 50, a hundred, um, watch hours by themselves. If they're getting like a hundred to 400 watch hours by themselves, I just need to make like 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 of those. Just make them until I'm monetized and then I'll be monetized. That's, that's all there is to it really. So the thing is I've figured out multiple systems for um you know different variations of youtube because you can see this isn't an education channel this is music it's different it's like um you know yeah it's different but you can see how i've figured out various different types of youtube approaches and it's not just oh i've done one thing and made that work i mean i did get the podcast monetized in like 30 days I got the podcast channel in 30 days um, monetized. Now, again, that's live stream. And yes, that does trade on my name. That does trade on my name. But um, you know, I figured out how to make some of these things work. Um, let's see. Yeah, it's no problem. It's like I'm not I'm not dunking on you. I'm just saying that's like if, you know, you can make a lot of different things and you just have to understand the data behind them. And if you adjust accordingly, you can make these things work. It's just that you have to pick the right topics more. Um, the right topics matter. Uh, yeah, Dream and his face reveal. Actually, I have a plan around a video about how to make a faceless YouTube channel. And then that video will probably piggyback off of this whole Dream reveal. So uh, gaming can be difficult but there's ways to do it. It there's like strategies for it. The problem is a lot of people are, Oh, I'm just going to do a let's play channel. A lot of people just do um, a let's play channel. And then that 
is what they think will grow because that worked 10 years ago. A lot of people keep trying to do what worked on YouTube 10 years ago and then they complain when it doesn't. One of the reasons I keep making new channels, it's another thing that distracts me sometimes from growing the main channel is I keep testing things. The music channel is a passion of mine, actually. The music channel is a passion because what a lot of you don't know is for the music channel, um, I don't make the beats myself. Uh, a producer does that. However... I do some of the animation and after effects myself, and that helps me keep my skills sharp because I'm actually a better editor than people think. In fact, um, it, I can show you, I want to show you guys something. I want to share something with all of you real quick. So there is a video that I'm working on that I started on today. that will probably come out this week. I want to say that it'll come out. I want to say that this video the full video, 15 tips small YouTubers need to know, 15 tips and tricks small YouTubers need to know. The full video will probably be out, I want to say it'll come out Tuesday or Wednesday. I want to say it'll come out Tuesday or Wednesday. It's a sponsored video. It'll come out Tuesday or Wednesday. I want to show you about two minutes of this video because on this video, I pulled out all the stops and I wanted to show everyone, excuse me, what a good editor I am because some people from time to time, uh, don't think that I make or I'm capable of making high quality content. It's just that I figured out how YouTube works and I figured out there's diminishing returns on just going quality, quality, quality. I figured out the quantity can work better, consistent can work better, and that my production values are high enough and my quality is high enough. I don't need to obsess over quality. Nobody needs to be Mr. Beast. Um, but I do want to show you guys that on occasion, it's nice for me to pull out my skills, just like how with the book... With the book, I was able to show everybody my writing skills, my writing ability, and it's doing really well. It's an Amazon bestseller. Um, it's getting good reviews, good ratings, and people are actually impressed with it. I even got a glowing review from a professional editor who's a full-time editor who owes me nothing, um, and she made a video about it, and it's dope. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to premiere two minutes or so of my latest video that I am editing. Um, it'll come out Tuesday or Wednesday. Thursday at the latest because there is a video I need to put out before this about the new copyright changes to YouTube and explain them because I got some updates from Team YouTube while I was at Vid Summit. But I want to show you guys this video. You're going to see just what I'm capable of if I try to edit. Get rid of your intros immediately if you want to grow as a small YouTuber. These intros are killing your retention rates and making your videos underperform in YouTube. You need to get right into the content, deliver value immediately because you only have about eight seconds before you lose the viewer forever. Number two. Focus 80% of your attention on editing to retaining your viewers in the first 30 seconds of the video. This is make or break for your video because you could lose anywhere from 30% to 50% of the audience in the first 30 seconds of your YouTube videos. To get better retention rates, what you want to do is make sure that you're using audio and visual cues and proper editing techniques to keep the pace moving and to get that content right in front of your audience in that first 30 seconds in a way that's impactful and makes them want to watch the rest of your video. Number three, stop making selfish content. The only way to really grow on YouTube is to wait for it, actually make videos that people want to watch who don't know who you are and don't really care. And as harsh as that might sound, if you are a small YouTuber and you may want to feel like, well, I want to express myself or I want to be authentic and all of those things. Authenticity is important. Expressing yourself and your personality is important. Do that in the context of the content itself. But when it comes to the topic that you are choosing, you have to put the audience first. YouTubers who put the audience first will win. Make it about your target audience and not about you. And then you will have a better chance of getting views for your videos. There are videos on this channel that I know will underperform because they're not always in alignment with the core audience. They are sometimes another audience that I might be trying to build and that will get less views. I know which videos will get 50,000 to 100,000 views, and I know which ones will get 10 to 20,000. If you want to grow on YouTube, prioritize topics for the largest overall audience in your niche possible. Just make the videos that you know they want to watch. Number four, audio is more important than videos. And there you go. And so now 
you guys get to see my glorious editing abilities. And that's what a compressed video, because I have to compress it to upload it to StreamYard here, uh, by a lot, by a lot. Uh, because I'm going to be uploading it in the highest quality when it goes out. That'll be probably Wednesday or Thursday, like I said. But that is what happens when Roberto decides to go all in and edit the hell out of a video and actually try. Green screen isn't that special. It's pretty easy to do. I have the best lighting and stuff like that, as you guys know. I put a lot of money invested into that. But you can find simple solutions for green screen lighting. I use an Elgato green screen. It's seamless. It costs $175. And then it gives you perfect seamless uh, green screen with no wrinkles. Then I just use all my lighting uh, to perfection. I use Ultra Key. And I made my own custom version of Ultra Key in Premiere Pro. I'll probably make that preset available for free to people to get um, as far as an ultra key, but it's really good. And then I um, just then go in and do the special effects, use Mogart files from um, Adobe Premiere Pro. I bought a couple of Mogart packs. I got a lot of free stuff from Adobe stock. I got some stuff I paid for from Adobe stock and Envato. I've got stuff from Storyblocks using my music and my sound effects from Epidemic Sound and just editing and tweaking it and stuff like that. So when I put a little bit more effort and time into these things, I can make the highest quality education videos that any you know YouTube channel has ever seen. And it's fine. Maybe not the highest because Ed from Phil Booth is much better than me by far. And so is his editor. Between Ed and his editor, they can, between the two of them, run circles around me. I ain't putting 40 hours into a video. I'm not, I'm not that guy. I'm not going to put 40 hours into a video anymore. Uh, I've tried that before. It didn't help me. <laughs> but I don't mind putting in a good 5, 10 hours into a single video. I normally don't have to do that much to a video. I only have to put in usually two hours for the videos that I make and they do fine. But if I put like five to 10 hours into a video, that's what it starts to look like. And that's about a 16 minute video. It'll have about maybe somewhere between six and 10 hours of editing and it will be perfection. And I can justify that because it's a sponsored video. So with being a sponsored video that financially justifies putting that much effort in for a video. But other than that, uh, my videos do fine without that level of editing. That level of editing is almost overkill. I want to do it a couple of times a month on some of the sponsored content and on some much, much shorter videos sometimes just to remind people and the one to also um, sharpen my skills and flex my skills and test myself and challenge myself. And it is fun to edit that way sometimes. It's fun to edit that way if you don't do it too often. Editing that way every day would burn you out. If you edited like that, for eight hours a day, every day, you will be burned out and you'll hate YouTube. I swear to you. And that's what happens to a lot of people. It grows them. They get subs, but they end up hating YouTube because that's a lot of work and you don't always get the return on investment or the views that you want or the subs that you want for doing that. And so when you don't get that, you don't make enough money and you put all this time in um, and you give up other things, you give up hobbies, family, you know, um, you don't spend enough time with your spouse or significant other. It like, you know, that kind of stuff starts to eat away at you liking YouTube when you don't feel any kind of like work-life balance. So that's why over editing is bad and it's burning YouTubers out. Over editing is really burning YouTubers out. I try not to do it, but I can edit like that. And I just want people to see that every now and again, just like how, again, I like sometimes when people see my other skills, I like when people see my after effects skills with the music channel, some of my graphic design skills on the music channel, people got to see my writing skill flexed with the book. Sometimes I show my photography off. I don't always, I rarely show people my photography, but people come to the house. I have my photography work in the house. So like you can see here, I'm actually a really good photographer. This was with the 200, the 600 millimeter lens. Um, this was at Zoo Atlanta here in Georgia. And I have all kinds of stuff like that hanging up around the house that I shot myself. When people come to my house and they're like looking at the walls, it's my artwork, it's my photos, it's my artwork, it's my paintings. And people, you know, get to see that. Um, and sometimes that's nice to just, you know, people can see your abilities and appreciate it, acknowledge it. I don't always put it out on YouTube though. That's the difference. I don't, I don't always post it on Instagram, YouTube or social media. Sometimes, sometimes you just don't want to do that stuff, but sometimes you do. Sometimes you do want people to put respect on your name. And so once in a while, you're going to get a high level um, Roberto edit. So I can remind everybody that I was editing video and doing uh, Adobe Premiere Pro and Photoshop and After Effects before YouTube ever existed and before some of these YouTubers were ever born because I'm 38. So 
sometimes you just have to flex your skills, flex your muscles. Um, and that's how it is. Uh, DRM, no copyright music. What's up? What's up, bro? I love what you do. I've been subbed for a year now and I hope one day to be just like you, bro. Keep it up. Hey, don't be just like me. Be just be you. Don't, don't be just like me. Be you. But I hear you and I hope your uh, channel goes well. Um, Prince Jaden's adventure says, this is great info. I saw an explosion of growth when I started to take the approach uh, three weeks ago. Thanks for the confirmation. Yeah, I think on uh, quantity. Hey, the creepy pasta channel. What's up? What'd you miss so far? Uh, we did some analytics stuff. We looked at my music channel. We're still kind of looking at the music channel a little bit. Uh, we looked at um, the highlights channel. We might look at the podcast channel. I haven't done a podcast episode in a while. So, um, yeah. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Sir Logic Ghana. This guy has brains. Follow him and be smart too. Uh, appreciate it. Yep, uh, you're a voice actor with a faceless channel. Uh, it's really important that the audio is great. Oh, I cannot stress that enough. It is super important that the audio is great. Roxy has a question about shorts. Okay, this actually gets to a YouTube update kind of thing, which is dope. Uh, we can talk about that. So Roxy asks, Roberto, do you think the same kind of growth can happen with posting shorts on the main channel, or is there still fear it might impact views negatively for the long term? If you are a small YouTuber, I think you should post shorts on your main channel, and I think it will grow, grow you faster. And I think they fixed the issues with shorts. If you are a regular YouTube content creator and you're making money from your YouTube channel or you're monetized and you're making good money and you're not that small or it's full time for you, I don't think posting shorts on the main channel only because – not right now anyway. Uh, maybe wait till the ads roll in because here's what I think. One – with YouTube putting ads on shorts, I trust them to get it right. So when YouTube puts money where their mouth is, then I trust it. You know, when YouTube puts their money where their mouth is, that's when I trust everything. So with them running ads on shorts, that I trust. That I trust them to get right. You get what I'm saying? Because then there's money on the line if they get it wrong. So I trust that. My issue is when you, when you have your main money engine being YouTube, I don't want to mess with the main money engine. That's my philosophy. So for full-time YouTubers and bigger YouTubers, you're probably not going to see us post that many shorts. There'll be exceptions. There'll be exceptions. Colin and Samir did it and it worked out great for them. But I think some channels will do it and it'll not mess with anything too badly. I think others will do it and it'll be like, oh, uh, what the hell? Um, and so I have a plan for my shorts content and it will involve my green screen uh, and my editing stuff. My plan will be for that to literally make shorts about big YouTubers and that has a broad audience and people watch them. So I think I can game the shorts algorithm talking about big YouTubers, which I've not done up until this point, but I got to 500,000 subscribers without talking about big YouTubers for the most part on rare occasion. So I think I'm justified at this point to milk it a little bit for the channel growth and take advantage of shorts. So I'm going to hit the shorts algorithm by talking about that. And I'll do that on occasion on the main channel. The interesting thing, though, is I have data and stories that I can share that most people have not heard about certain big YouTubers and how they became successful. So a 45 second short around that will be actually pretty interesting to my audience, but also to the general audience in YouTube. So I... I think I'm going to experiment with that and see what happens. I'm going to experiment with that and see what happens. Now, since my main audience doesn't like shorts, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uncheck a box and I'm not going to share it to my subscribers. I'm going to let YouTube and the algorithm do my work for me and find the audience and not rely on my subscribers at all. And it'll just find the people who watch that content. And so that's how I'm going to do it. But I'm going to do it sparingly. I'm going to do shorts sparingly on the main channel. I have an entire plan for YouTube shorts on the highlight, the highlights channel. And I have another exclusive shorts channel plan that I think will do really well. And so, um, and that one will be a shorts channel that focuses on influencers exclusively. I will do videos about influencers and see what happens. So, so that uh, that's what I'm working on. And that's what I think about shorts. I think shorts for small YouTubers, though, to answer the most important question for most people here, 
on your main channel as a small YouTuber, I see no downside on doing YouTube shorts since they're going to run ads on it and monetize it. And now they're doing super thanks on shorts. So if you're already monetized, there is an incentive to do shorts. That's very clever of YouTube. That's very clever of YouTube. So I have a video coming out about YouTube shorts monetization and how that's going to work going forward. And so um, my plan is to uh, capitalize on that. My overall plan is to uh, capitalize on that. So that video is probably the video that I put out tomorrow is the YouTube shorts update for monetization, talking about super thanks on YouTube shorts, talking about the new shorts monetization policies, the updates. You are going to be retroactively grandfathered into shorts if you have the 10 million views and the 1,000 subscribers. So that will count. They weren't going to do that before, but they changed their mind on that. So that's great. Um, and I think that a lot of people will be very happy with it. It's an alternative um, you know, path. So I think that that's... Um, yeah, I think that that's something that a lot of people will benefit from. Yep. Bridal Sewing says, I'm almost at 75K, Roberto, mostly thanks to your advice. Really appreciate you taking the time to help. Absolutely. I'm so glad, um, Bridal Sewing Techniques. And you're going to hit a silver play button soon. Congratulations. You'll get the silver play button soon. Um, question, what kind of light setups can I get on Amazon for my videos? I use Aperture a lot. I use Aperture and I use Godox. I also use Newer, N-E-E-W-E-R. Um, those are the three brands that I've used with the most success. And I think they do well. Uh, Newer is going to be the cheapest out of them than Godox, than Aperture. But Aperture is reliable and it's really good. And they have a really good app and a really good ecosystem. So I like uh, I like them a lot. It's what I use for my lighting, um, and uh, some and for the desk I light this with Elgato lights on the desk, so that actually helps quite a bit. Um, and so that's what I use. Am I tired of my creator hat? No, not at all. I am not tired of the creator hat. I just am wearing the leather one because I was wearing it in a video because. If I use green screen and then the brim of this, see, it doesn't work with the green screen. So I'm using the all black leather hat. So it doesn't work with the green screen. You see what I'm saying? Because if I even tilt slightly up, it'll be a problem with the green screen. That's the that's the thing. And I don't want to have to go through the trouble of Matt selecting it. So that's all. Uh, buy the merch. If you guys want, you know, uh, buy the creator hats, hoodies, T-shirts, buy the merch. Uh, you just can't use this one with green screen. <laughs> So that's that's the only reason. It's just a green screen thing. Um, but I love my creator hat. Uh, videos are 90% not subscribed. That means you're reaching an audience purely algorithmically, which is good for potential growth. I think that, I'll be honest with you. I think a lot of you think you're entertainers and maybe you haven't built up the skill to be an entertainer. Cause to be honest, I'm a much better educator than I am entertainer. I can be entertaining, but I myself am not an entertainer in the sense of being very, very entertaining. Now, given an entertainment niche and subject matter, I can be entertaining enough about something I'm knowledgeable. Like I can tell you anything almost about Game of Thrones and I can make it fun and entertaining and I can do good delivery. I can do good delivery on entertainment, pop culture, genre stuff if it's nerd culture, but that doesn't make me an entertainer. I'm no, I'm no, um, what's his name? Andrew Schultz. I'm no Andrew Schultz. I'm no Joe Rogan. So like, you know, Joe Rogan's an entertainer. Andrew Schultz is an entertainer. Um, Alexandra Cooper is an entertainer and they can be entertaining and they can tell entertaining stories about their life. I can't do that. I can't sit here and tell you super, super entertaining stories about my life and be entertaining and be a personality. Not going to really work. But if we were to like, if I were to talk 
nerd stuff with you. Star Wars, Game of Thrones, um, Harry Potter. I can make that entertaining. If I talk anime, I can make that entertaining. And I can do some storytelling in there. And that would work. But that doesn't make me an entertainer. It makes the content the entertainment genre because it's pop culture content. That doesn't make me a great entertainer, no matter how many views I could get on it. And I could get tens of thousands of views, like probably twenty to 50,000 views on that type of content. And by the way, I have in the past, some of the OGs remember that on the weekends, I used to do movie and TV reviews way, 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 way back in the day. And I used to get views on my Game of Thrones reviews back in the olden days. Back in the olden days, I did some Game of Thrones reviews when that was hype. And I'm not known for that content. And I was getting 20, 30, and 50,000 views. And I was a much smaller YouTuber than I am today. And I was getting those kind of views on content. I have not a subject matter like, you know, related on that content. I'm not known for that content. And people don't know me for that. And I could get the views. So it's, you know, you can go into entertainment around pop culture and not be the greatest entertainer in the world and get views. A lot of YouTubers have done it. And a lot more YouTubers will do it in the future. A lot of you, though, are overplaying your hand that you think you're more entertaining than you are. Kelly Stamps is an entertainer. Kelly Stamps is an entertainer. I'm not an entertainer. Kelly Stamps is. You get what I'm saying? Like, And a lot of you on the spectrum are closer to being me than you are to being Kelly Stamps. And it's not even close. So I think what a lot of people do is a lot of people wish that they were entertainers, but they haven't earned the right to say I'm an entertainer just because you want to make entertainment style content. You get what I'm saying? Being an entertainer is a skill. It's a skill. I think entertainers on in general, not all, not all of them, but um, most of them are extroverted. Uh-oh, Monkey says, how would you grow an entertainment vlog channel in 2023? Personally, I'm the wrong person to ask because of this exact conversation. I'm the wrong person to ask because I wouldn't grow an entertainment vlog channel because I'm not Kelly Stamps. It's personality that grows in entertainment. You either have the personality and the talent to do that or you don't. In that particular instance, strategy will not help you. It is entirely down to personality. It is 80% personality and 20% strategy for that. It is 80% personality and 20% strategy. And if you want to be an entertainment vlog channel, you either have the charisma, the looks, the confidence, and the talent, or you don't. And that's just facts. And that that's also that that's just facts. Because that's the reason people cannot do it very easily, and very few people have done it. Because you can't hardly name anybody who's not Kelly Stamps, Janelle Ileana, Emma Chamberlain, like you know, Joanna Cedia retired. Like that's it. That's it. So you either have the, I mean, you could argue um, Louis Cole, but like he, uh, fun for Louis, Louis Cole, uh, but that was travel. That was travel. So that's different. But like you, it's a really specific skill set, my friend. It is a very specific personality type. And it's generally an extroverted person who can do that to some extent. Some introverts can do it. Some ambiverts can do it, but it's mostly extroverts. So someone has the personality the charisma and the looks to do it, or they don't. That's just, you know, that's just how it is. So again, and that's my feelings on it, but I would be the wrong person to ask on that one for that reason. Cause I think that that one, that one strategy won't help. I'm like, I'm better at things that do not rely solely on talent, but that can be trained for those of you who are anime fans. It's that I like, look, if you're a genius, God bless you. If you're a genius and you got that good, good bloodline, God bless you. Me, school of hard work, genius of hard work. That's all we do in this house is like we achieve it through training, tactics, and strategy, and being clever because uh, we ain't relying on talent over here. We weren't necessarily uh, blessed in that way when it comes to certain things. When it comes to certain things, um, much easier to succeed in that arena if you're like six feet tall 
and like pretty or handsome, like much easier. But if that's not you, it's uh, it's a bit of a challenge. It's a bit of a challenge. Uh, your content has always been engaging. Yeah, I think I'm I think I'm good at engaging. I, I can do engaging. Um, I can be entertaining enough in a dry subject. So I have that going for me. I have that going for me. Uh, you like the video, like the transitions and the keying. Thank you. I appreciate that. Roto, are you using a green screen with this? I'm still learning Premiere, and it's hard to do some stuff in the background. Um, so when I when I do that video that I showed all of you earlier, I don't know if some of you saw it, some of you missed it, we'll premiere the video uh, clip again for later for some of the people because we have more people watching now. Um, but for that, um, I did use a green screen for that. So um, I like when I, if I, I'll show you guys real quick. So I do have a green screen. Yeah. So as you can see, I have a green screen. I rarely use it. It's an Elgato green screen that just pulls up and it's dope. It, it's so dope. And because I have really good lighting, what I do is I take the lights. Those are red and purple lights right now. They're just like lightsabers, but if I turn them white, they balance out the lighting for the green screen. And then between that and my aperture light, they just work perfectly. They just work perfectly. And so then that's how I'm able to do the chroma keying and green screen and get it perfect. And I made my own custom uh, version of Ultra Key in Premiere Pro. And then it just does it really good. So... Uh, we are looking for more information on shorts RPM, but uh, it's going to be low. <laughs> it's going to be low, but um, we're, we're going to get some more information. You think the editing on that video is great? Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, you got to work your lighting for the green screen effects to be better. For the green screen effects to be better, you have to um, make sure you light the the entire screen pretty evenly now a trick around that as long as you don't move your hands a bunch and you're standing still you could use some masking to help you but it's a pain in the butt so it's better to just light the screen as best as you can said the editing is fire your editing skills are amazing thank you i appreciate that roberto unleashed thank you gabe and it was great seeing you uh this week um, yeah, you can say those are basic edits, but I'd like to see you do better. Um, you can say those are basic edits, but the thing is subtlety is a thing. A lot of people over edit and it's why people burn out. People burn out because they over edit and editing and trying to prove how fancy you are doesn't necessarily get you more views, doesn't necessarily get you more subs. So, you know, people can sit there and they can brag really, really hard on their editing, but it doesn't always do enough. Whereas basic edits, but done subtly and done effectively, basic edits done effectively. The same thing as basic thumbnails done effectively, basic topics done effectively, beat people who try to be flashy, but ineffective. So people can squander energy and effort and money in the pursuit of trying to chase, you know, the PewDiePie's and Mr. Beast of the world and oh, high quality content. And it won't do them nearly as good. Meanwhile, there's people doing basic edits, basic videos, basic topics, showing up every day and crushing it. And so a lot of them and some of them get more views than bigger YouTubers than them. So sometimes being fancy and flexing doesn't do people a lot of good. So. It is what it is. What stream cam do you use? Like I said, I'm using uh, some actual cameras. So I'm using a Sony ZV-E10. That's this one here. And then this is a Sony A6600. So I'm using real cameras as my webcams. Uh, not Bogart files, Mogart files, as in motion graphic art files. Mogart files are a specific file type to Adobe Premiere Pro. Uh, I am answering comments. Uh, 
Bro, remember me? I had 80K views, 200 subscribers. Now I'm following generally one niche, sci-fi and Star Wars. And now I have over 500,000 views and over 1,000 subs. Thank you for your tips on your videos. My pleasure, uh, Darth Roz. I appreciate you. That's pretty dope. That's great. I love Star Wars content, as you know. And so it's always nice to see a Star Wars YouTuber come up. Congratulations on getting more than five times as many subs, getting about roughly, um, I want to say like uh, six, almost six times as many views that's amazing uh so keep up the good work keep going uh once you hit you know um a couple million uh views you'll have like ten thousand subscribers and you'll be on your way uh the elgato face cam is uh fine to start out with so don't worry about it too much the elgato face cam is fine for a, a beginner. There's nothing wrong with it. And you can save up and you can get a better camera eventually. So just keep it real. Keep it moving. Question from Aussie, K-pop mom. I have a live chat show every weekend. I do trim the start, remove the countdown, Etc. after the show, but it does, but does it help with views if I remove it and re-upload as a VOD instead? Would it get more impressions? I don't really think so at this point uh, for YouTube. Um, I don't think it matters. I've actually gotten plenty of views uh, comparable to regular videos, just leaving these up. So I think it's fine to just um, not re-upload it and just um, edit and trim it down itself. Um, so yeah. Uh, yes, sometimes viewers can get tired of the same format. That's why it's nice to switch things up. I have plans for switching a lot of things up. So between that and some videos shot um, in the couch uh, section of the office, some videos shot you know, here with the desk being the backdrop, some stuff in the art studio in the basement, there's going to be some more stuff going on with that. And I think it's going to dramatically uh, improve a lot of different things. Hey, Annette, good to see you. <laughs> Let him know. Thanks. Yeah, appreciate you, Charlotte. What program do you use to schedule your uploads? I don't use a special program to schedule my uploads. I just use the YouTube uh, uploader itself. Excited to read your book. Currently go over notes from last week. Last taken. Yeah, Vid Summit was epic. And so that's great. And I do appreciate everybody who is supporting the book. Uh, it's great. Something awesome. How creators are profiting from their passion in the creator economy. Uh, you can buy it on Amazon. You can order it into your local bookstore if you want. Uh, local Barnes & Noble, your local library, any of that. And it is appreciated. The book is doing really well in Amazon right now. I believe it's like a... Number two bestseller in its category. I think it's doing really well. Um, so, yeah. It's not that I believe in quantity over quality in every instance. I think that there is a threshold of acceptable quality in your niche. If you get to the threshold where your videos look as good as the other people in your niche with like 100,000 subscribers, you don't need to keep upping the quality. Or even if you're at zero, if you're at like 1,000, and your quality is as good or better than people at 10,000, then I wouldn't need to up the quality anymore. And I would go on consistency and quantity more, take more shots, get more things, take more shots, get more things. That's And I just showed you my data like um, over multiple channels to where we know the answer is volume over time. And I've proven this time and time and time again. And most of the biggest YouTubers, with very few exceptions, that are much more recent that just happened to go viral. And again, I didn't go viral. That's the thing. I grew a YouTube channel without luck because I grew without growing viral because I made 820 videos to get to 100,000 subscribers in three years, in three years. And that's what I did. Um, and so that's uh, that's the difference. In fact, if I pull up the analytics... Um, let me let me go back to let me go back to analytics real quick. 
And then what I can do is, hang on. Nope. And switch cameras. I'll show you guys uh, some OG analytics. Let's go to analytics. Switch accounts. Go into analytics. Go to advanced. I want to show you all what happened back in, I want to say February of 2015. Between that and then, what was it? June. Say June 2016. That's like 14, 15 months. 14, 15 months. Okay, yeah. Okay, this is perfect. And then we'll go videos published. Yeah. We don't need the watch time. All right, so here we go. So back for like 15, like I think that's like 15 months or is that 14, 14? It's like 15 months. Yeah, it's like 15 months. So in 15 months, I published, uh, you know, 473 videos. That's me being a daily content creator. It's me being a daily content creator. And you can see I didn't get lucky. Nothing went viral and got me a bunch of subscribers. If we rank it by which videos got me subscribers, my graphic design videos, I barely did any YouTube help videos back then. I only got a couple thousand subs off of it. You can see that I got um, 91,000 subs in that 15 months. What I did was I grew from 20,000 subscribers to 100,000 subscribers in like 14 or 15 months. And it's because in that 14 to 15 months, I made videos every day. And that's what I did. That's what I did from like in 2015 through 2016. I just made videos every day. I made videos every day. Mostly I did it around software tutorials. So you can see what grew me. You can see the things that got me the most subscribers, got me thousands of subscribers, web design, graphic design, video editing software, working from home, making money from home, graphic design, you know, I made a couple of YouTube help videos. They did not get me that many subscribers. I may have got 5K total off of YouTube help back in the day. And back then, I, I, you know, I still had more than enough subscribers to justify talking about logo design, you know, first thousand subs. All I did was help people under a thousand subs. That's it. Nothing fancy. And I only got like maybe 5,000 subscribers out of it. Most of my content was working from home, which is what I was doing. Freelancer content, because that's how I made my money. It was freelancing design, you know, Photoshop, video editing, camera gear, tutorials, design your portfolio, design your portfolio, design your portfolio. So all I did was make videos. And every one of these, just like most of these videos got me hundreds upon hundreds of subscribers. And it just cumulatively compounded. Because see, look at how many of this is just like all these things. And look at how few, look at how few YouTube videos it is as far as YouTube help videos and how few subs they got me. It was really mostly the graphic design and making money from home and photo editing and video editing tutorials, hardware and software that got me my views and got me my subs. And it's because I was doing it every single day. Because when you make enough of these videos and you can see how many videos I was making and you make like, you make like 400 videos and they get you something like on average, like I made 470 videos and like on average it was getting maybe like 300 or so. Like, you know, if you get like 200 subscribers on average and you make 470 videos, yeah, you're going to get like a hundred thousand subscribers when you're averaging 200 subs per video when you're averaging like 200 subs per video and then your outliers get you a thousand subscribers 
and you make 470 videos, that's all it is. That's not, it's not some big secret. It's that I was able to do it. And then because I was making videos that related to an audience of creative people and artists, it was a similar pool of audience. It may have looked like variety content, may have looked like variety content, but the overlap of graphic design, photography, and video editing is a significant enough overlap that in that period of time, these videos were able to relate to a, a, a broad enough audience that still collectively could be interested in enough of the same videos. And again, it's not like I got that many views. I got like 5 million views in that time period, but I was able to heavily convert those viewers into subscribers at almost 2% ratio. And that translated to why I was able in 15 months to go from 20,000 subscribers to 100,000 subscribers by adding another 90,000 subscribers in 15 months, but I made 473 videos to do it. And that's the math, that's the science, that's the data, that's the facts. And it wasn't YouTube help content that grew me. And so this is why I know that being consistent in what you do, consistent in the audience that you serve, consistent in the frequency of your uploads, consistent in the quality that you make, Instead of just sporadically making high quality videos, if you make sporadic high quality videos, you're trying to win the lottery and you're trying to go viral. And that's why I think those people think YouTube is luck. YouTube's not luck for somebody who does it strategically and does essentially dollar cost averaging. I play YouTube like I play the stock market. I go very safe. I go very tactical. And I basically dollar cost average and don't try to time the market. Getting a viral video is like trying to time the market. I don't time the market in the stock market. I don't time the market in YouTube. I don't trace. I don't chase trends. I don't focus heavily on capitalizing on timing because it's too stressful to do. Too much risk of burning out from doing things a certain way. I've been able to do it this long because I do things that don't burn me out. I do things strategically. I do them smartly. Um, and I do enough of them for a long enough period <clears throat> period of time. What happened with me during the pandemic was I got depressed during the pandemic. And if you go back to our earlier session in the analytics, you can see that if I had just been able to power through the pandemic, which I couldn't, I needed to be healthy, then I'd be at a million subs already. Because I could just use the volume game because we already know that from a volume standpoint, if instead of making 50 videos a year, like I did in the pandemic, if I did 150 years, if I did 150 videos in 2020, 100 videos, 50 videos in 2021, 150 videos in 2022, instead of doing less than that, then um, I would have gotten um, around 100, 150,000 subs each of those years. And then I'd be on the way to a million or I'd already have it. And so it's the momentum thing. Momentum grows a YouTube channel. A lot of people do not talk enough about that because now now the people who grow on youtube they use youtube shorts and they go viral there and they grow which is fine use youtube shorts where people make big high quality videos because they have a lot of money i didn't have a lot of money i didn't come from money so like you know i didn't come from money so i i don't like oh just throw money at growing a youtube channel take out credit cards i can't do that and i can't advise that you know i can't advise that it doesn't make sense so what i know how to do is make videos affordably because remember the camera setup that I'm recommending, it's not the cheapest in the world, but it's not the most expensive camera setup in the world. Camera setup that I would recommend is this. This is a Sony v ZV E10. It's $700, but it'll last you for like three years. So it's cheap. If it's going to last you for three years, buy a $20 lens for about 200, $300 This 20 millimeter lens goes to, I think F2 and it's solid. I use it at f2.8 and it looks great. It's crisp and it's clear. Combine that with like a DD microphone that's like 60 to $100 and you have a great microphone. Maybe you get a wireless for 160, DD wireless for 160 or a road uh, lab set up for 200. That's not that bad. So under $1,500, this will be the perfect YouTube setup and it'll look like a regular YouTuber. Now, of course, you could use your smartphone, get some accessories to help with the audio. That would be cheaper. But if you want a YouTuber, YouTuber setup, or you wanted to vlog and you wanted higher quality, you wanted to do a budget version of Casey Neistat, you could do it with this Sony uh, ZV-E10 and this decent lens. And I think that that would be fine. 
and you could see how good it looks and it can stream too. So it'd be the highest quality streaming camera you could use too. So I feel like that would be enough and that for three years, you could get really good stuff out of that. Maybe just upgrade the audio, get some good lighting, get some accessories. Maybe you get a green screen and you could do wonders with that and it wouldn't be super expensive over the course of those three years of your YouTube career. And you'd be making high quality content without worrying about the autofocus or worrying about the audio or any of that stuff. And it'd be really good. Um, it'd be some, it could be some of the best looking content on YouTube and it'd be enough. And that's enough of being budget and not having to throw a lot of money at that. And then with that, you could just talk about TV shows that you like uh, or the, uh, that are the most popular TV shows. And you can get views doing that. And it could be fine. Or you could do reaction videos and you can get money and you can get views. You know, I know everyone would like to be famous for their personality. But sometimes you guys, if you wanted to be a YouTuber and make a little bit of side money, you should pick a topic that you can do pretty easily. Now, if you have experience and you're an older person like me, I'm 38. So I've had a career. If you have a career, you can talk about the things you've done in your career. You don't have to be an expert. You're someone with experience. You're a practitioner. Then you get to do education content. And there's more money. There's more money in education content. If you're a small YouTuber or you're a mid-tier YouTuber, you're in the YouTube middle class. You're in the creator middle class. Middle class creators make more money on education. It's only the big YouTubers that make money on entertainment. Big YouTubers make money in entertainment. The middle class would make more money in education, but they would get less views. They would get less subs. They would get less fame. You can get less fame. You can be famous and make less money than a smaller YouTuber. There are plenty of people who are famous. They make less money than me. They get more views, but they spend more money to get those views. So they don't keep any of it. That's what a lot of people don't understand. People make all this money, but they spend it. And so they don't keep as much. So they do that or they do lifestyle inflation. I'm not a young 20-something-year-old dude, so I'm not blowing all my money on a fancy car. I'm too old for it. I'm 38. I'm too old for it I, until my midlife crisis. Until my midlife crisis and I'm 45, no sports car for Roberto. I have to wait seven years to have my breakdown and buy a sports car. So no no sports car for Roberto. Now, um, if I was younger, there's all these things that creep into your head when you're younger as a content creator and they blow their money. They'll you know, chase the fame and the glory, so they'll spend all their money back into their channel, which investing back into your channel is fine. It's a good idea. It's a really good idea to invest back in channel. I've invested heavily back into my channel, mostly hardware and software um, and projects. But most working class creators cannot do that, so I don't give that advice, and I try not to set that example of you have to throw money at everything. I think that if you're going to throw money at anything, you throw it at production and hardware and tools that will last you for three, five, or seven years. And that's things like buying, you know, your Elgato green screen for 175 because it works really well. Buying a good microphone like the Shure SM7B, you know, buying um, a good camera and a good lens. That's things that last and it's worth it. And it's tax deductible. Most importantly, it's tax deductible. So th those are good things, right? So I, I think it's reasonable for working class creators and creators in the middle class to really try to maximize profit on their channel, not go heavy, going heavy and putting it in. It doesn't always pay off for everyone. We hear about the people that pays off for, right? We hear about the people that pays off for. We never hear about the people who wish they hadn't done it. So um, I think about that a lot. And I, I think some of you, could have a very successful, very frugal YouTube channel that doesn't cost a lot of money. It might have upfront cost, but not a lot of continuous cost over time. And then that might be better and that might be more reasonable. And that's kind of how I play the game. And I especially played that game from zero to 100,000 subscribers because I was broke. And again, 100,000 subscribers, I still was not making money from YouTube. I was making it from Amazon's influencer program, but not from YouTube. I was in an MCN. They took half my money. It was in MCN. They took half my AdSense revenue for years, for years. And big YouTubers didn't warn me. I think I started giving YouTube advice to small YouTubers because I got screwed in that contract. I got screwed in that contract. I got screwed on a couple of brand deals when I was a young YouTuber, when I was small, when I was at like 14,000 subscribers. And nobody warned me and nobody told me. And there wasn't really a YouTube advice community. So that's why, I mean, the only people that I think did YouTube help content were Gideon Shalwick and David Walsh back then. It was Gideon Shalwick and David Walsh. And then when I started, that's when Daryl Eves, it was about same time, around the same time, myself, Daryl Eves, um, and Tim Schmoyer. Tim was working for Real SEO back then, so he had a job in it before that. 
um, working for a real SEO. That company I don't think exists anymore. So um, he was working for them. Uh, Daryl had his ad agency and then he was doing YouTube help content on the side. Um, I started doing it. I think um, Sean started doing think media, but it was more tech content instead of YouTube help. He got into that later. So the early YouTube education community was very small and I didn't really get into that until much later. And I didn't really start doing any of that heavily until I already had a hundred thousand subscribers, but it was partly to warn small YouTubers about doing the wrong things and about bad contracts and MCNs, how to get sponsorships and do it right, how to get paid properly because I got screwed over in the early days and nobody warned me. So, you know, that was a whole thing. So I made most of my money early YouTube from Amazon and freelancing and consulting. Like, and not consulting on YouTube, but consulting on marketing and social media marketing and back end stuff. I was working behind the scenes for years. I made money editing for companies. I was editing for businesses uh, as a video editor and doing their graphic design, doing the um, designs for the trade show booths. That was my whole thing. So um, that's how I was making my money in the early days, even up to 100,000 subscribers. I didn't make really good money on YouTube until I got out of my contract. And they stopped taking 50% of my money. That's why I can uh, start making a little bit of money when they stop taking 50% of it. <laughs> so, you know, that that's a whole thing. So, yeah, that's why I really got into this um, is there was so much I didn't know that if I had known it, I would be a much bigger content creator and be a much more successful content creator. But I also wouldn't have lost so much money like you know i really got screwed on that uh contract and uh like mcn's multi-channel networks are very predatory towards small youtubers um roberto do you know anything about spanish content creators i'm thinking of serving a latin demographic i wonder if you have any insight pucky pachenko pucky pachenko is crushing it with YouTube shorts specifically. Pucky Pachenko is doing um, Spanish speaking content and is killing it. The other thing is uh, Portuguese content and Hindi content are two of the fastest languages growing in the YouTube ecosystem right now. I think that um, Spanish speaking content is going to do extraordinarily well on YouTube in the coming years and it's doing very well now. So I, I think that if you go to the Latino market, you're going to do very well. Yeah, Kelly Stamps is 100% authentic, 100%. Roberto just stabbed all his vloggers in the heart, but I do agree 100%. Yeah. Roberto took the Arya Stark route, hard work, yep. Uh, Angelique, okay, what's up? Says, uh, Roberto, the first chapter of your book has a lot of references to self esteem, even though you don't directly say it. Yep, because <laughs> it matters. Because it matters. Success is largely predicated on um, uh, self esteem. A lot of people do not realize how much self esteem and confidence plays a role in success. And it's probably one of the things that plays the majority role. Uh, I would attribute most success to that. Um, it's not a yellow screen. It's just that I have these other lights, these other colored lights would affect it on the thing. So that's, um, that's what was going on. Oh, Jeff, your, uh, your, your copy of the book finally arrived. Uh, I super appreciate that. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, yeah. If you guys want, remember, order the book on Amazon. It's called uh, Create Something Awesome, How Creators Are Profiting from Their Passion in the Creator Economy. Uh, that is my book, Amazon bestseller. Uh, we've been doing really well on it uh, since it released. And any support on the book is well appreciated. Nard Villain said, you seriously inspired me to do more green screen stuff. Yeah, it can be it can be fun. It can actually be fun.
Hey, Roberto, I know this isn't a black and white answer, but any advice on scaling a YouTube channel, what YouTube Danica I focus on specifically? Uh, this is a great question. So the data that you would focus on specifically is this. You would focus on which videos gave you the most subscribers if your goal, which most people measure their YouTube channel by how many subscribers they have, which is, it is what it is. So if you look at the topics that grew you the most, you do variations of those topics. I'll give you a primary example. If I was still doing graphic design content, uh, what I would have done is uh, this five things they don't that you don't learn in graphic design school. Guess what I could have done? If I was smart back then, which I was not, <laughs> I was not as smart as I would have liked to think. The smartest thing I could have done following up that video that I did in January um, 2015 was that in, let's say, April, right before high school is about to get out and people are like, oh, I got to start college or new semester or whatever. If I was smart, I would have done a nine things they don't teach you in, gra in graphic design school. And that video would have been able to do just as well as this. And then in the summer, I should have done a 12 things they don't teach you in graphic design school. And then in the fall, I should have done a 15 things they don't teach you in graphic design school. Now, someone would say, Roberto, isn't that you just milking that same topic to death? And isn't that excessive? And wouldn't that burn out your subscribers? I keep showing you all that more than 75% of your views on any given video do not come from your subscribers. So no, it wouldn't matter. And then as long as I didn't repeat the same things in each of those videos, it would be fine to reuse a working title formula and just up the ante in terms of going five things, nine things, 12 things, 15 things. Yes, that would have worked for me. And so then instead of just getting the... 4,000 subscribers I got from this video, I would have been able to do that video three more times. And therefore I would have gotten another 12,000 subscribers. And if I was smart, that's exactly what I would have done. And that's just one video. And that's one of my best performing videos. And so I would have capitalized it on that. Um, so then on this, how to become a web designer in 2015, what I would have done if I was smart, since that got almost 3,000 subscribers, what I would have done is um, I should have done a how to become a web designer, 10 things you need to know before starting. Um, I would have done a um, seven things every web designer needs to know slash design careers. I would have like found three more ways to capitalize on my best performing video. And therefore I would have gotten four times as many subscribers on my uh, on that same topic spread out throughout the year by revisiting my best performing videos once a quarter in the same year. Once a quarter in the same year uh, of making a new title around a similar topic and capitalizing on that topic to those same types of people would have been in my best interest. And so as long as I could have figured that out, then that would have helped me. And then I would have grown even more. If I was smart, that's how I would have done it. So that's the data. The data is find my videos that convert the best subscribers. Now find three more ways to make that same video, three more ways to make that same video, or even up to 10 more ways to make that same video. What I should have done is this was best video editing software. What I should have done is best video editing software for Mac. Best video editing software for PC. Best video editing software for Android. Best video editing software for iPhone. I would have gotten four more videos out of that. Then I could have went best video, best, um, and that would have been best free video editing software for all those things. Then it could have just been best video editing software without it being free. And then it could have been best budget video editing software, which means that I could have gotten no less than 12 more videos out of this topic. And that would have helped me by a lot. Um, five ways to make a uh, passive income um, online should have done nine ways, 12 ways, 15 ways. So you see what I'm saying? I could just take, I could just take my best 10 performing videos, find 10 more titles out of my best 10 performing videos, make a plan for 100 videos for the year. And then I would all of a sudden massively 
expand my success by just taking the top 10 or 20 videos that I've made that got me the most subscribers and then finding out how to make five to 10 more videos around those same topics, same combination of topics without being too repetitive. And the way I could change it is I could also change the style, the format or, uh, and the look of those videos and expand on them and just make them different enough, just different enough and spread them out. And then I'm not guessing. I know that I can grow the channel off of that. And just that would form what my hundred videos from the year is. The thing with that is if you do that, it's not going to be fun. You might have to learn to enjoy the process or have fun with the edit, but it's not going to be fun because when you do that, there's no novelty, there's no variety, there's no spice of life, but it does work. And so if you're doing it, that's how you make it a job. It's work and you can enjoy it. It can be fun because it's, it doesn't mean that, oh, you have to hate it. It just means that there is some rep if you're going to repeat what's successful, it is repetition and repetition gets a little boring. Now, you could also use the 80-20 rule. I could figure that out, figure out those 100 videos and say, okay, I'm going to, instead of making 100 videos, I'm going to make 80. And then I could experiment and have fun with 20 and then spread them out so that like twice a month or so, I'm doing experimental, fun, zany videos so I don't lose my mind. And I could sacrifice views to do that. And so if I'm doing like 10 videos a month, I make two of them for fun and eight of them to be effective and to be work and to do the work. And then that balances it out. And then it's like, okay, I made 120 videos this year. I made a hundred videos that were for growth. And then I would have made 20 videos that were for fun. And that might be enough work-life balance. And that would be the game. And that would be the game, you know, or you make 80 videos and you make like 20 for fun and you make a hundred videos and that's how it is. And you can take, um, you know, two weeks off a couple of uh, weeks at a time or something like that. And so that's how you would effectively create a strategy using data properly. In my opinion, in my opinion, that's how you use data properly. That's how you grow a channel. But what most people do is they want to optimize the videos that are the most fun for them instead of literally just telling the data saying, make more of this. The, the, it will tell you to make more of this. And if you just make more of this, you'll be successful. But it's very hard for us to just fall in line and do exactly what we know. Like we'd all have washboard abs if we were good at that, right? If we all had the discipline to just do what we know we're supposed to do, we'd all have washboard abs now, wouldn't we? We'd all have washboard abs. We all would have gotten at least B's, if not A's in school. Discipline is hard. It's not special to succeed, to be honest. It's just that it requires discipline, and most of us don't have enough of it. We de we have more dopamine dependency than we do discipline, and that's what the truth is, harsh that it may be. And that's why we don't get certain things. Because we all know what we need to do, if we're being honest. We all know what we need to do, and we just don't have the discipline to do it because it's not as enjoyable as other things. And so, um, cause even I know what I need to do to get a million subscribers and it's just like, ah, oh, do I really want to do that? Um, isn't it time to have, pay an editor to help with the output? Uh, it could be, but the problem was I want an in-house editor. I want somebody here and local and, uh, the pandemic kind of squashed a lot of those plans. So, uh, it's, but that plan's on the table again. So. Yeah. Over editing does for a lot of people compensate for poor shooting and planning. I, I try to just shoot as like, I got the lighting, I got the lighting, I got the audio, I got the thing. So I try not to do it that way. So, yeah. Yeah. You get tired of editing. It burns you out. Like people do not understand how much like people do not understand how much editing can burn you out. Malevolent Elephant says, I do basic edits and still get my two to four million views per month. LOL. Yeah. Basic editing is like basic editing can get you millions of views. You heard it here first. Sometimes when I put a lot of edit work in, I get less views. Yeah. I mean, same thing happens. Same thing happens to me um, too. Yeah, I didn't see whatever the AP Knowledge's comment is. I literally just didn't see it. Uh, so maybe if they post it again. 
Question, I'm searching for a new camera, previously using the EOS, EOS M50 Canon. I'm waiting for the, wanting the same look, but better focusing. What's the best camera to use for quality? I'm telling you, uh, the Sony ZV-E10, the Sony ZV-E10 is superior in every way to the Canon M50, even the Canon M50 Mark II, I'm telling you. So I recommend the Sony ZV-E10. Topic title, storytelling, thumbnail is what matters to 90%. The rest is like editing is minor. Yeah, I agree, Zane. Uh, when do you think the good time to release merch for a channel would be? When you can make it good. When you can make good merch. When you can afford to invest the time or the money into good designs. And that not designs for your logo because nobody cares. Like designs that mean something to the community. Question, I'm able to edit out the first 30 seconds after my video of uploading my intro sound effect got me a copyright violation on the video. I want to keep it up on the channel. Um, there is an option for editing out music and sounds that are copyrighted in YouTube where it uses AI to remove the sound. So I would go into your YouTube uh, dashboard on desktop, not mobile, on desktop, not mobile, and remove that using the AI removal option, and it should get rid of it, and you should be fine. what's the max videos we can schedule in the YouTube uploader? I've done up to more than 30, so I don't know if there's an upper limit. I don't know that there's an upper limit. I've scheduled 30 days worth of videos in advance before. Boris, the beast, you bought the book. You're on chapter eight. I hope you're enjoying it. Yeah, the book is called Create Something Awesome. Yeah, um, yeah, Elite Landscapers, you can edit that audio out, and it should be fine. Yes, some viewers actually enjoy the same format as long as the content is new. Pace's Kitchen, just purchased your book. I'm finishing Sean Cannell's book, YouTube Secrets. You grew your channel the old-fashioned way through grit and grind. Yes, yes, I did. DMV MTB says, I made 200 videos before I got monetized. Yeah, that sounds about right. That sounds about right. I usually see people make 100 to 200 videos to get monetized. Johnny B, this is a great story. Five years to hit 1K subs, then hit 10K in a sixth year. You never know when it's your time. You never know. Sometimes it's predictable if the data is there. But I think life is what really gets in the way of most people when it comes to growing their YouTube channel. I think life and time freedom. She Fire says, you look so young then, Roberta. Yeah, uh, I think I look very young for 38. I'm almost 40 and I still look like I could be in my late 20s. Uh, that was clean shaving, Roberto. Uh, the memories, yeah. I like if I if I shave everything, I get younger by a lot. Oh, we got a super chat. Super chat. So the Gamester Show says I've been growing with PS One game reviews exclusively, but it takes a lot of time. Any tips to help with consistency? Channel has nine thousand five hundred subs. Well, congratulations on nine thousand five hundred subs. You're almost to ten thousand. Uh, in terms of the consistency, the thing is getting faster at the edits by learning how to get more efficient, getting a better editing workflow, maybe even getting a faster computer or learning faster software. That makes a big difference. I think that one of the things that makes me successful is just how fast I can get out and edit um, even something advanced. Like when I did multicam editing for my interview with YouTube's VP of creator product, um, Amjad Hanif, um, I was able to do the multicam editing and I was able to do it very quickly. They got me the footage, I think a couple of days after their interview was out and I got that thing edited in like one day afterward. And then I had to spend another day with prep for uh, letting it upload. So I was able to get that turned around really quickly, even though it was a 20 minute interview, I was able to edit it multicam and get it knocked out in just like a day. 
Um, so I think that editing fast, learning to edit fast, learning every shortcut for your editing software, learning most of the menu system, learning what these things do and why and how to edit and getting as fast and efficient as possible will allow you without lowering the quality will allow you to be much more consistent. And if you can edit fast, you burn out less. Like people do not realize how important efficient energy management is energy management and time management go hand in hand. Real productivity is learning to be efficient at using your tools and not making uh, and like not agonizing over the creativity as much. I know that sounds weird to say, but like if you can eliminate decision making from your edits and get it down to a process that gets rid of most of your decision making, you'll find that you'll be a lot happier with the edits for one thing and they'll go a lot faster and you'll have more energy and then you can be creative in certain parts of it a little bit more instead of like dragging everything out. So I would say that it's really about uh, becoming an efficient editor. Yeah, I meant when throwing money at it, I'm talking about equipment. I'm talking hardware. You guys have seen my set. Like it's hardware that I throw money at, not promotions. Um, I only would advertise things like I would buy ads for the book or something. I would buy ads for the book, but like I don't use advertising to grow on YouTube. I don't really think it works to be honest with you. Um, Everything I've seen indicates that advertising your YouTube videos does not work. I don't do it. I don't do it. I've seen people do it. It doesn't work. So I throw everything at hardware. Now, other people, when they throw money at their YouTube channel, they're throwing it on stunts. They're throwing their money on stunts, which is fine if it works out. If it works out. Johnny says, the only thing I've paid for as a creator with 10K is someone to cut my long form video into shorts with captions. Yeah, I have a very efficient system for actually making shorts using Adobe Premiere Pro. Adobe Premiere Pro can turn a video into a short with almost one click, honestly. Uh, yes, I have an LLC for my channel and that helps with all the uh, taxes. <clears throat> Yeah, you can use your phone when you start, and then you can save up and maybe you get a Sony. El Jefe Review says, small creators shouldn't overly be focused on gear. I grew my channel to 20, scones with ch 20 subs with just my cell phone. That's right. You can do it with just a cell phone. You can do it with just a cell phone uh, and a cheap lamp and a $20 uh, lav mic. I eventually upgraded, but it can be done. Facts. Facts. I know plenty of creators who do that. Star Wars Theory got the 300k subs on a broken iPhone. Star Wars Theory like used a real just a iPhone and he was faceless channel and he grew to 300k subs. And now he's at like 3 million. But now he uses real gear. <laughs> Here's a practical question. As an independent, what do you do for health insurance? I pay out of pocket. I buy my own policy. So you have a private policy. I'm 38. I'm healthy. I don't smoke. I don't drink that often. And I don't particularly leave the country. I've gone to Canada. So I want to travel more. But basically, um, I'm under 40. I'm under 40. No major pre-existing conditions. And I don't do risky behavior. And so my health insurance is like 200 and something a month. I forget. It's like 200 and something a month. And that's for a good plan. And with like, you know, I have good, reasonable deductibles and I have basically full coverage. It's my life insurance policies and then my business insurance policies, my car insurance policies, my homeowner's policy, my warranty, and then my equipment insurance that's what adds up in terms of insurance, but my healthcare coverage. But again, I have I don't have major pre existing conditions like some people. So my health and I'm like, and I'm healthy, and I don't smoke. If you don't smoke, you don't smoke, you don't drink, you don't do drugs, you haven't had a history with illicit substances, 
You know what happens to your insurance premiums? And again, if you're blessed enough to not have pre-existing conditions, your insurance premiums are negligible at that point. They're not that high. If you're like under 50, they're not that high. So as an independent, $200 a month is not a massive expense compared to other utilities and bills that I have. I'm not saying it's cheap. And I know for a lot of people, that's like a crap ton of money. But think about it. It's not the same thing as your car note. It's not as expensive as your car note for the most part. Some of you, it won't be as expensive as your car insurance. So healthcare coverage, I know everyone's like, and they cling to like the employer for the healthcare coverage. Now, again, I am single. So that helps, right? If you have a family on your healthcare plan, it's different. But if you're on your own and you're single, you can have good healthcare coverage. You can pay out of pocket. You don't have to go through your employer. Sometimes you pay more and get less through the employer's group policy because it's about what the employer wants to pay, not what's necessarily good for you. So you could probably, in some cases, most people don't realize this because I didn't realize this as an employee. You might be able to do better on your own with private healthcare coverage than your employer. Even out of pocket, it might be better because you could actually probably get more for less if you bother to look and to look at the pricing and go directly to the private sector, if you go directly to the private sector and you get your own private insurance, you might be better off than with your employer in some ways. And then also you retain control because once you start paying for your own stuff, once we get away from our, once we start paying for our own stuff, and that's the other good thing about having a side hustle. If you get a side hustle and then you, and then you can afford to get off of the employer's plan, then the employer is not holding healthcare coverage over you anymore. And you're also not beholden to what they offer. And then if you do that, that's one thing. And if you side hustle, you start putting money in your own solo 401k or your own Roth IRA and you don't worry about, and yeah, you could, if the employer is doing matching, then do that as long as it transfers over eventually. If the employer is doing matching and you can also uh, not lose that um, retirement plan when you're not, at, when you no longer work with them, as long as you don't lose your retirement plan and benefits, and I'm not talking about your pension, I'm not talking about your pension. I'm talking about your own retirement plan, your 401k. As long as you can keep control of that after you leave your employer, then fine. But if not, what everyone needs to do, what everyone needs to do is they need to get independent of their employers. And I'm not talking about quitting your nine to five job. I mean, slowly start to take away their leverage. Get a side hustle that doesn't compete with your day job. And that doesn't necessarily have to be YouTube. It could be Amazon influencer affiliate marketing. And you could be your Instagram combined with that Amazon. Or it could be TikTok combined with that Amazon. Or it could be a blog or a newsletter or something else. And you could be doing that. It could be a podcast combined with Amazon influencer. That's how I made my money as Amazon influencer at first. I didn't make money on AdSense for years. And the multi-channel network took half my money. So I made my money from Amazon influencer and freelancing. Back then, there was no Fiverr back then. So if you do Fiverr, Upwork, user testing, hire writers, whatever, or you do Uber, whatever it is, you make some extra money on the side, and then you don't upgrade your lifestyle. Use that money to start putting your money into your own retirement plan. Hashtag not financial advice. Um, and you put money into your own retirement plan. It's in your own Roth IRA or your solo 401k or your Roth 401k, whatever you want to do, whatever um, your financial advisor tells you or whatever you look up on your own, whatever. You do that. Now, they don't have that over you. You're building your own retirement fund on your own terms. You're putting away money for that. Okay, cool. If And it doesn't have to be a lot of money. $500 a month maxes out your Roth IRA. And you don't have to necessarily max it out. It's preferable if you do, but it's not a lot of money we're talking about. From a side hustle, what are we talking about? Earning an extra 30 bucks a day or something? You know, 30 bucks a day, you'd make an extra $1,000 a month if you make 30 bucks a day. So we're not talking about a lot of money here, okay? And so if we can do this, then we have some leverage because we have our income won't ever be zero if we side hustle. We have extra money we didn't have before. We can build a $1,000 emergency fund we didn't have before. Maybe we can build it up to more than a $1,000 emergency fund. Then we can go ahead and we start putting money away for retirement, have something in our own controllable Roth IRA. And then you could look at, well, if I want private insurance on my own, maybe I just start paying for it out of pocket and maybe I get a plan on my terms that I can afford. Now, if you... If your employer is covering your entire family, then that's a little harder. And the best thing is then probably to put money away for retirement, put money away to get a down payment on a house, go into a mortgage, put money away for a rainy day, 
uh, put money away into the emergency savings, maybe something like that. But not not but not lifestyle inflation, not buying purses and handbags, not buying Jordans, not buying new Xbox games. That's the problem people have is there is the consumerism instead of investing. They consume instead of invest. And so if you put your money into these things, then you have some leverage. And then when you, you know, you can start thinking about leaving a nine to five job when you're not relying on them for health care, when you're not relying on them for retirement. And a pension is the carrot they dangle to trap people and to make them give up on their dreams. And so um, my thought in terms of your practical question is, again, I pay out of pocket. No one. I, so I'm in control because I pay out of pocket just like I do everything else. I'm in control. I'm in control. One of the reasons I got into a house and got into a mortgage is because now landlord, I don't wait on a landlord to repair something. I have my own warranty and then it can get repaired. And I also have credit cards if I need them for emergencies. I have warranties on everything and I have homeowner's insurance. So I don't have to wait on a landlord for nothing. And I don't have a landlord that can say, hey, I want to sell my house. You're going to have to leave. That happened to me a couple of times. It's not that I was a victim. It's that they wanted to sell the house and I didn't want to buy because the house was in disrepair. So uh, I'm in control. And the same way I became an entrepreneur, I'm in control. So I can't be fired and I can't uh, you know, be told what to do when it comes to the house that I live in. So I have control. And then I have my own health insurance. So again, I get to pick my policy. I get to pick my doctor. It has to be a network, whatever, but I get to have it my way. That's what control offers. And you get control when you take leverage. Well, I'm sorry, you take control when you get leverage. So you have to create leverage. And leverage is largely from controlling your time and controlling your money. And so what I did was I had to give up my nights and weekends. I had to give up my vices. I had to stop going clubbing. I had to stop drinking alcohol, not going clubbing. I had to stop spending money on girls I wasn't going to marry. I had to stop buying video games. I sold my Xbox. I pawned my Xbox to pay bills. And then I hustled and it was rough for a couple of years. And then I was successful and then it didn't matter. And now I can have video games, but I hardly play them. Now I can look for the right girl, settle down, get married, have some kids, but I'm already like ready made. I already am a homeowner and an entrepreneur. I control my time. I control my money. I control my energy. You need leverage to do those things. I have my health care insurance and I have my life insurance policies and I have my um, homeowner's insurance and all the other insurances. I'm overinsured. I spend a, 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 between all the insurance policies. That's what eats up my money. Uh, besides that, I did retire my mom. So that eats up a portion of my income as well. I invest back into the business. I don't have a team for the YouTube channel. I have a team for the coaching business. So I pay a lot in salaries. So I make a six figure income, but I have six figures worth of expenses too. I have six years worth of expenses before living expenses. And I retired my mother. I helped my uh, younger siblings. Um, you know, like I helped my brother. I helped my two sisters. I pay my team. You know, and then I, I live frugally aside from buying gear. Aside from buying hardware for my business, I live frugally. I am not out here wearing $500 Jordans. I don't drive a sports car. I drive a Nissan. You know, so I do everything as practically as I can. And, you know, I live a good, healthy, upper middle class life. A lot of that's for security reasons. You know, you want to live in a nice neighborhood. Um, you know, you want to be protected. I have good security, good alarms. And this is a good neighborhood. The sheriff literally lives three houses down the street, you know. And so I don't think people want to mess with the sheriff's department here in Georgia. I don't think it'd be a good idea for them. Um, so I, you know, I really think that a lot of people, what they need to do is they need to research what their situation is when it comes to things like health insurance, the healthcare marketplace. You don't always necessarily get a better deal with your employer. Some people do. Some people do. I want to make that abundantly clear, but a lot of you do not realize that you might be able to get a better plan for less money on your own. The group policy won't always be in your favor. And you won't always be able to go in network like the network for the doctors may be limited depending on the plan they have, depending on the carrier that they have. So, you know, that's the thing. Um, and I have United Healthcare. You want to go with one of the major providers like United, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, Kaiser Permanente. You know, so th that that's the most realistic way to go about it, I think.
let's see. We got some more questions here. Just join the stream. Quick question. Are shorts channels on a brand channel or a brand new channel with a new email? Uh, either is fine. It wouldn't make a difference. I would give each channel its own private email, though, for security reasons. So for security reasons. Um, yeah, an LLC is good for liability, insurance, and tax purposes. Let's see. Creighton TV says, Hey, Roberto, it's a good thing to go back to old videos and improve the time thumbnail. If those videos are still getting views or just make more better content around that, God bless. So, Creighton TV, the answer is literally to do both. It's quite literally to do both. Um, I have no problem. If you're still getting views on videos that are old, update the titles and thumbnails for sure. If you think you can do better on them, but also make new updated versions of those videos, double dip that way and uh, do both. So thank you for the super chat. And yes, that makes sense. Thank you, Eve Riot Girls of Wrestling for becoming a channel member. Appreciate you. Dose of Dad. Long time no see. Thanks. Yes, merch can be sold at any time. But listen to Roberto, make merch worth buying. Yeah, you got to make merch worth buying. Don't slap your logo on it. Put something that means something to your community on it. Uh, do you ever do YouTube channel reviews like vidIQ? I do, but like mine are via super chats. It's like super chats of like $25 or something like that, but I'm not doing them right now. I haven't done them in a little while. Uh, we'll do them at some point. Um, right now, I'm just not as into them. Then the analytics deep dives have been doing really well. Yeah, Star Wars Theory is rock. Star Wars Theory is probably my, one of my favorite YouTubers, actually. I, I basically watch all of his videos. And I come into the live stream sometimes, and I'll super chat. Uh, one of my highest... Bridal Sewing Technique says, One of my highest viewed, highest sub-earning videos was filmed with a bad camera and trash audio. The content was very helpful for the viewer, though, so it was done super well. That's a lot of my content from the past, actually. That's a lot of my content from the past. Yeah, the, the content itself, the, the value of the content, a lot of people keep talking about high quality content, but they don't think about high value content. High value content for the viewer, value for the viewer, what the viewer is interested in, that's high value content. Then the other stuff is the uh, quality. I think high value content is completely underrated by most people. So is what it is. Technical T chilling, watching some FL, trying to get mine focused. Uh, short week for me, but that means strain on recording. Yep. No, I hear you, brother. Taking risk. Entrepreneurship is life changing. It's true freedom, makes you as much money as you wish. Absolutely, elite landscapes. Absolutely. Yes, batch recording is the best way to stay ahead of YouTube burnout. I couldn't agree more. Elite Landscapes. I work for a client four days in the last 40 days, earn 15000 in profit. Nice. Don't start your dreams tomorrow. Start today. That's a that's a good message. I like that. Uh, Roberto, does having a website do anything for you or no? Um, I have it for uploading my recipes, cook channel, but the traction I get um, over there is hard. I make a lot of money from my website. 
so it's all down to your business model, my friend, and how you utilize it. And it might not feel like a lot of traction compared to uploading a video to YouTube where you get an algorithm and all those things. But I think a lot of people underestimate having a website, having an email list, even using a LinkedIn profile properly. A lot of people are underestimating how valuable that is. And for me, it makes me a lot of money, builds my network, builds connections, and websites are credibility. So uh, I don't underestimate it. Um, yeah, I don't spend a lot of my disposable income personally on quote unquote fun stuff, uh, because, um, the things that I enjoy, I've already bought into them or they're kind of free or they're kind of cheap. Honestly, the things I enjoy are cheap. So for me, um, what I am spending my money on is, um, going back to the gym. I'm going to be going back to martial arts. I'm going to be taking Brazilian jiu-jitsu this time. So I'm going to get into the best shape of my life over the next two years. Over the next two years, my goal is again to the best shape of my life by doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu, maybe one other martial art that I'll switch over to after a year and a half um, and going to the gym two to three times a week for the next two years. So between going to the gym two to three times a week for the next two years, uh, this winter doing the Brazilian jiu-jitsu and doing that for like at least a year, and then maybe another martial art after that, probably Taekwondo. Um, doing workout in martial arts for the next two years is where my disposable income will go. And if not that, then I will quite literally hire a personal trainer. So for the next two years, my goal is to get into the best shape of my life before 40. So getting into the best shape of my life before 40 is where my money will go. Um because other than that, I mean, it's like there's not much for me to spend my disposable income on in terms of having fun. Travel is work. Travel is work. I can go on a vacation every now and again. That's fine. Um, but there's a limit to that. And again, doing it single is not as fun as, you know, not doing it single. So like as a single guy, there's a very limited amount of and I don't have many vices. So I did like there's not a lot of like, oh, spend money on fun. It's like, I can play the video games I already have. I can play, there's video games I own that I haven't played. So I can do that for fun. I mostly enjoy reading. There's some books I haven't gotten to. There's some new books in my favorite fantasy series I haven't gotten to. And so that's super cheap, right? It's super cheap to just read books. It's super cheap to read books. Going to the movies is cheap if you want to go to the movies. Um, I like going out to dinner sometimes with my siblings or taking my mom out to lunch. It's relatively cheap if we're not being super, super fancy. So I don't have to spend a, a large amount of disposable income to have fun, to enjoy myself. I can enjoy very simple things. Um, I think the simplest things in life are probably the better things in life. I don't think you have to be extravagant to enjoy yourself or to claim you're having fun. And I don't like really buying, like I buy quality clothing. I buy, I'm trying to get to a minimalist wardrobe. I'm actually going to be giving a lot of stuff that I don't wear or don't fit because now I'm in a pandemic body um, to charity. Um, so I'm giving away a lot of my old clothes and thrifting them or giving them to charity or donations and stuff like that. There's a few pieces and things I'm going to give to my brother. Um, so like, I don't really, in terms of spending money, I don't really take a lot of pleasure in spending money unless it's on gear, to be honest. Gear is the only thing I really feel like spending money on. I like, you know, for fun, for fun. Again, my fun is going to the zoo and taking photos like this. My, my fun is photography and I already own the gear. My fun is photography, I already own the gear. The, the only way to spend money on photography is to travel to somewhere else to take photos, which is fine, which is what I'd like to travel and do, um, or to um, pay models for their time to take photos to practice more of the portraiture stuff. Uh, since I don't like to, I don't like to necessarily do that for trade with them. You can, you can trade uh, pics for, um, you know, pics for time. You can trade pics for time. Some models still do that. I'd rather just pay people, to be honest. I'd rather just pay people for their time. Um, when it comes to that and it eliminates a lot of headaches down the road if you just pay people for their time. So that's the only other thing with photography I guess I could spend money on is either traveling to location or paying models for their time to shoot. Um, I really enjoy photography. Um, I enjoy painting. 
drawing, reading, writing. So I have all the crafting tools. I have the whole art studio in the basement. I spend money on that and the renovations down there. Um, so, you know, there's, um, there's a lot. Melly says, I'm a single mom and I turned my side hustle into a business. Yes, you did. Congrats, Melly. Uh, I got out of debt, saved, and I'm self-employed. The first thing I got before I quit my job was to get life insurance. Facts, facts. Get the insurance. What's your thought on closed captions? Um, I try to do paid closed captions or use my Adobe software for the closed captions for almost all my videos. I think I'm behind by like two videos, but yeah, I try to do that where I can. YouTube's getting better on automated closed captions, so they could be okay. Is a 40% retention rate to grow a chance enough to grow a chance? Depends on the length of the videos. Depends on the videos. Shoot for 50. Shoot for 50%, but like 40% is good, but shoot for 50. And it depends on the length of the videos. Uh, shoot for 50. Best thing to do is get rid of any custom intro and any asking for stuff in the beginning of the videos and just get to the content, like I said. My boy, Technically T with $20 super. Roberto, question for you. Need to completely revamp my merch. Any recommendations since I don't think I want to do Teespring again? Dude, come over to Spreadshop. Come over to Spreadshop and you can link it to the YouTube merch shelf the same way you did with Spring. So come over and flip over to Spreadshop. All right, my link is in the description. It's a free link. It's totally free. My affiliate link is in the description. Come on over, sign up for Spreadshop. Okay, I'll walk you through it. I've actually done a merch tutorial, um, so get on that. And then T, for you, uh, my advice is you can either hire the designers at Spreadshop or you can go on Fiverr and get some really, really dope merch done on Fiverr. Get a designer, have them give you a vision for it and everything like that. You can work out those details. So absolutely, man. Uh, I would get on spread shop. If you're not happy with spring, I would get on a uh, spread shop and I would use Fiverr or I would hire the team at Teespring. Cause they actually do have a design team. They actually used to design PewDiePie's merch back in the day. They designed um, PewDiePie's merch. They designed uh, captain awesome sauces uh, shirts they designed shirts for a lot of the biggest YouTubers back in the day. So I would get up with a uh, spread shop. Yeah. Uh, training. I am training anime style. I'm literally just going to go into the hyperbolic time chamber for two years. I'm just going to literally go into the hyperbolic time chamber for two years, train my butt off, get into the best shape of my life. That is literally the plan at this point. So, yeah, it is uh, going back to martial arts, going back to the gym. And if I really want to be crazy, I will hire a personal trainer. They're not as expensive as it sounds, by the way. They're not as expensive as it sounds. If you go to your local go to your, your local gym or if you look locally, you will find people who do personal training. They probably have a YouTube channel on the side, and it, it can be very reasonable. It can be very reasonable. If you're making money from your side hustle, it's reasonable. Like it might not be as easy a nine to five job, but if you're either an entrepreneur or you have your thing, but you can't, it's hard to put a price on your body. You know, you only get one of them. You only get one of them. So like, I only get one body um, and 40, you start to slow down. So I'm just going to get in the best shape of my life before 40 and call it a day and then live in that body forever. Closed captions. Do they work to grow a channel? Should you offer them a closed captions? Aren't about growing a channel. Closed captions are about doing something kind to specific people in your audience. Closed captions are not there to grow your YouTube channel. Closed captions are there for people who need closed captions for one reason or another. So closed captions are not a growth strategy. Closed captions are a way to be kind to a subsection of your audience. So um, if, you're use, if your goal was, well, what if I, can I grow my channel if I use closed captions? then closed captions are not going to help you grow your channel. Closed captions are going to help some members of your audience. <clears throat> 
She fires says, I'm eliminating my intro. Someone said it's best that new movies no longer open up with actors names and movie title shown instead several minutes and after attention grabbing scene. Yep, that's the way it's going. How do you feel about promoting your YouTube on social media platforms? Um, it's fine, but don't expect too much from it. <laughs> no, excuse me. Do you have any thoughts on the language teaching niche? I teach English to Spanish speakers. I think the language speaking niche is going to blow up more on YouTube, and there's a really good business you can build on the back end for it. Um, you can build really good business on the back end for it. So it can be extremely lucrative. And I think it's going to be big. I think it's going to be a very big deal. What smart lights are you using in your background to light up your room? So I use aperture lights. I use aperture lights and, um, that's most of my lighting at this point. And then I also use for the desk when I want to switch on, switch off. These are. Elgato lights here for the desk to do that. And I can control them with a Elgato stream deck. So that's cool. And my other lights, uh, those are all aperture lights. So that's what I'm using. Yeah, I heard, uh, I know about Mr. Beast uh, channels. He has more than five different language channels at this point. He's going to have, he's going to have 25 of them. If I'm not mistaken, he's going to have 25 or more. Um, because I think they're going to do Mr. Beast gaming and Mr. Beast reacts in other languages too. And he's built out and owns the company for that does the dubbing. So he owns that and he's going to, um, sell that service to other content creators. So he, he's going to own that part of the creator economy for having the videos dubbed. He's going to own that whole thing. And so they're building a dubbing studio. That's like all this stuff. And so like, yeah, so he is going to own that business within the creator economy, um, and he's going to own a lot of creator economy businesses. If I can become an investor, I will. But um, yeah, Mr. Beast is going to take over the world. World domination. He beat me to it. Um, so yeah. So that's pretty dope. All right, y'all. I think we're getting close to a wrap. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Because some of you... Um, some of you did not see it earlier. I'm going to show you a preview of the video that I have coming out on either Wednesday or Thursday. Cause I have some like YouTube monetization update stuff. I got to do a shorts monetization explained. I've got to do uh, new copyright rules explained. And so that's probably Monday and Tuesday. So Wednesday or Thursday, my video of the help small YouTubers, 15 more tips for small YouTubers, that video, 15 tricks and trips small YouTubers need to know. That video will come out on either Wednesday or Thursday, but it's going to be super high quality edit. Um, here is a preview of that video. Uh, well, I take a quick break and then we'll wrap up the stream. Get rid of your intros immediately if you want to grow as a small YouTuber. These intros are killing your retention rates and making your videos underperform in YouTube. You need to get right into the content, deliver value immediately because you only have about eight seconds before you lose the viewer forever. Number two. Focus 80% of your attention on editing to retaining your viewers in the first 30 seconds of the video. This is make or break for your video because you could lose anywhere from 30% to 50% of the audience in the first 30 seconds of your YouTube videos. To get better retention rates, what you want to do is make sure that you're using audio and visual cues and proper editing techniques to keep the pace moving and to get that content right in front of your audience in that first 30 seconds in a way that's impactful and makes them want to watch the rest of your video. Number three, stop making selfish content. The only way to really grow on YouTube is to wait for it, actually make videos that people want to watch who don't know who you are and don't really care. And as harsh as that might sound, if you are a small YouTuber and you may want to feel like, well, I want to express myself or I want to be authentic and all of those things. Authenticity is important. Expressing yourself and your personality is important. Do that in the context of the content itself. But when it comes to the topic that you are choosing, you have to put the audience first. YouTubers who put the audience first will win. Make it about your target audience 
and not about you, and then you will have a better chance of getting views for your videos. There are videos on this channel that I know will underperform because they're not always in alignment with the core audience. They are sometimes another audience that I might be trying to build, and that will get less views. I know which videos will get 50,000 to 100,000 views, and I know which ones will get 10 to 20,000. If you wanna grow on YouTube, prioritize topics for the largest overall audience in your niche possible. Just make the videos that you know they want to watch. Number four, audio is more important than videos. And that is a quick preview. I know you guys were super into it and then it ended so abruptly, but that's a quick preview of what you can expect, you know, for my upcoming video that comes out Thursday, sorry, Wednesday or Thursday at the latest Friday. But that's what that video is going to uh, look like. And I think that that's a super strong video for retention. And I think that that's a super strong video in terms of also showcasing my editing skills and my ability. And it's going to be a sponsored video. It's going to be Epidemic Sounds, a sponsor for that video. So uh, also that's another thing I'm doing. It's like I will be doing more of those green screen videos and um, that stuff for sponsored content specifically um, because I think that that's going to be really good for me and that's going to help in the future with brand deals. When you go a little harder for the brand deals, uh, that actually works out really well. Uh, that helps with those higher rates. And so that is something that I'm specifically working on. Also, even for live streams, I'm going to actually do um, – more things that I can put so that I can take restroom breaks during the stream more easily. I would encourage more of you who are live streamers to create like one to two minute like things, probably like two minute things that you can do that you can like uh, manage that. Um, Bishop, the thing is, I don't even want to film three videos like that, like even film three videos like that, even if I had help with the editing. I only want to put out one video like that maybe a week and I don't want to spoil the audience and I want to be able to just make videos where I can talk directly to the camera with uh, minimal editing because I would rather do less editing and be able to present my ideas kind of like Patrick Bet David and Chris Doe. I only want to do videos like that on occasion and I'd rather do more videos um, where I am a presenter and an educator in the way that Patrick Bet David and Chris Doe are I don't want to always have to like win on, oh, I can do these crazy edits or whatever. You know what I'm saying? I would rather win on my information and my presentation skills and my public speaking skills because I want to be, as I get older, as I get older, because again, I'm not a young YouTuber. I think over editing and all that stuff and fancy edits, I think that's really more for young YouTubers. And I'd rather be more like Patrick Bet David and Chris Doe and Gary V and not rely on the editing and rely more on my information and on my presentation skills and on my interview skills. Cause like the interview I did with YouTube's VP of creator products, that was a good video. And I got a lot of good response on that. And it shows me that I have the strength to be a good interviewer and to be able to show that I can do very powerful and strong interviews. And I can use my status as an insider in the creator economy to get those really good interviews. And so I'd rather, I'd rather win on the long form content on good presentation, good conversations, good interview skills, and rely less and less on the editing being heavy. I want an editor to help take over the editing and eventually all of the editing just so that we can go to daily, but I don't want the editing to go to the moon. I only want a couple, I only want like a few videos and maybe the sponsored stuff to be heavily edited, but I really would rather focus on if we can do strong interviews and if I can get really solid interviews a couple of times a month with people at YouTube, people at Facebook, uh, people at Instagram, people at Twitch, people at TikTok, people at other creator economy startups, other YouTubers. If I can interview YouTubers, success stories, middle class creators, they're full time that have success stories of how they went full time. You know, um, if I can do more of that, I have some of that from Vid Summit coming out. If I can do more of that. If I can do more of that, like, okay, strong interviews, put a couple of those out a month. News updates in the creator economy, put those out a month. Get insiders and people from like YouTube and the other platforms, put those out a couple times a month. Do my own tips and tutorials, put those out. Um, do that stuff and rely less and less and less on the ed editing 
but much more on my network, my presentation skills, my information and my strategies. I'd rather do that like Chris Doe and Patrick Bet David and Pat Flynn. I'd rather do things like that than have to show every time how great an editor, editor I am or have a fancy, fancy editor. I'd rather have a really good chop shop as far as we can cut clips. We can do this. We can do that. You, do, you know, I'd rather we have that and not be overly fancy. It might be a thing eventually as I do more meetings and more public speaking, have someone follow me around with the camera and do that. That makes more sense. And we can have someone edit all that. So I'd much rather look at the model that Patrick Bet David, Gary V, and Chris Doe are using and focus much more on production and access and interviews and behind the scenes and events and larger than life stuff in that way and rely a lot less on the editing to be fancy and the editing to be efficient. And I think that that will, I think like that will be a thing. Do you think the audience, the real audience should be here for the slow burn versus TikTok style stuff? Here's the thing. I think that short form content will be with us for a good while, but I think that, I think that it will burn people out because of the cheap dopamine addiction. I think it'll burn people out. I think long form and podcast win in the long run. I think take advantage of this trend of short form for the next three to five years. If you can take advantage of this over the next three to five years. However, it, the market will stabilize over the next three to five years. So it won't be viral, 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 viral. That will end. That whole, the viral vertical video will end in three to five years and it will be there. We'll have vertical videos, but they won't be going mega viral. The market will stabilize. The market will stabilize. And as the market stabilizes, and as Gen Z matures and gets old, because everyone gets old, it won't be a thing in the same way. It will not be a thing in the same way. It won't be a thing in the same way. But you know what's gaining traction and no one's talking about? Podcast is winning. Podcast is crushing it. And YouTube live streamers are crushing it. Look at what happened with LawTube. And look at how much money they raked in. That's a thing. And the future is also realistic content, like stuff like Ryan Trahan and Beheza. Those people are crushing it. So, like, I think, I think that there's a lot to be said for things that get us back to realism versus spectacle. I think realism will win over spectacle. I think that a lot of people will get burned out on over editing. And I think people will get burned out on short form content. I think that that's what's going to happen. And how do I know that? Patterns in human behavior and psychology. Everyone gets old. Everyone gets old. And here's the thing. More and more people are telling me that they are trying to beat their phone addiction. More and more people are trying telling me that they want to beat their phone addiction and that they are that that they've been binging TikTok too much and binging content too much and now they're trying to beat their phone addiction. So I think in a post pandemic world because I think also the short form addiction happened because of the pandemic. I really believe the pandemic escalated that short form addiction. And I believe people are going to wind down in a post pandemic world over the next three to five years. And that that's the psychology that will change. So that's how I know that is human behavior. And I'm, and I'm like almost 40. Yeah, there is, but it won't last. This generation that binge watches stuff like shorts is the most fickle generation I've seen in my life. The most fickle generation I've seen in my life. And besides, no one can name big TikTok stars that aren't now YouTube stars or are not legit musicians or are not now mainstream. So like TikTok doesn't have star celebrity status the way it used to. And besides, TikTok could still go away. Both the Democratic and Republican administration don't like it and want it banned. India's banned it, so it can't scale in the East anymore. And that's one of the biggest population. If, you're, if your app can't scale in the East, if it's blocked in India, your app has no future. If your app is blocked in India, it has no future. That's going to be like 2 billion people you'll never have. Any app that is banned in India has no future. Quote me. Quote me. If your app is banned in India, you don't have a future. So, like, I don't think TikTok lasts. And if, God forbid, anything happens with China and Taiwan, sanctions, 
TikTok's over. That's it. The end. That'll be the end of TikTok. Now, it won't be the end of YouTube Shorts, but that'll be the end of TikTok. And the craze around TikTok will not necessarily 100% translate to YouTube Shorts. So that's a real thing. That's a real thing. But I think that in a post-pandemic world, people will wean down their phone addiction just enough, and we'll see. Um, Absolute Guitar Avenue says, piggybacking off an earlier question, if you're not getting views, will changing the title and thumbnail help engagement a little different than earlier question? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. It largely depends on the market. I did this for my video that is my great resignation video and it exploded the video. I've tried it for other videos with poor results. So it's very much your mileage will vary. Your, it's very much your mile, mileage will vary. Hang on, I need to throw a lozenge on the diet over here. I need some Ricola. <clears throat> I need some water too. I'm done. I have to end the stream soon. I'm losing my voice. Um. Yes, the reason TikTok is getting banned is because Chinese don't use it, spy on users. Yep. Mm hmm. Yep. My biggest viewers on my shorts are from India. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. I'm convinced that no, an app cannot scale if it cannot reach India and the Eastern market. Denison of Light says, it frightens me how everywhere I go, people are walking around looking at their phones while they are walking. People will be walking towards me without even looking where they're going. Yeah, it's a problem. Yeah, and all the um, challenges on TikTok that are dangerous, that's going to be a problem too. So um, at some point, uh, I mean, they're being, they're under regulatory scrutiny now. Like they're under regulatory scrutiny now. So that's a, that's a definitely a thing. But I want to thank everybody uh, for checking out the stream. Uh, I really appreciate you spending nearly three hours with me. It is uh, time for bed. It, it's time for bed. Uh, it's over. I'm going to get some rest. I'm going to rest my voice. I appreciate all of you. Thank you so much. Um, I really do appreciate it. And um, look forward to this week's videos. I think there will be at least three or four videos out this week. It'll be two videos updating YouTube's policies on shorts monetization, uh, the new copyright policies, and my 15 uh, tips for new YouTubers. So those uh, three videos will be coming out. Thank you to all our super chatters. Thank you to all the new channel members, including Encounters with Strangeness. Appreciate you. Uh, she Fires, uh, everybody else, uh, Natural Relisha, um, Gabe, um, you know, a uh, feast with uh, Cornice. Um, appreciate all of you. MMASMR. Uh, thank you, everybody. And uh, oh, we got one last super chat. Um, play the music. Super chat. Uh, hey, Roberto, just want to say thank you for all that you do, your time, your energy, and your knowledge. You always drop gems. Much respect. Love, Hannity. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Uh, Denison of Light is a new channel member. I need to get a sound effect for channel members. Uh, I'll probably like hire someone on Fiverr to do me some new sound effects. I need a new soundboard. But I want to appreciate all y'all. Um, I think the way we're going to end uh, the stream tonight is I'm going to close you out with some music from my music channel, Zen Buster Music. Make sure you're checking out Zen Buster Music on YouTube. In fact, after this, since it's time for everybody to go to sleep, go over to Zen Buster Music on YouTube and play the 10 hours of music to help you sleep. And we can all go to bed to that tonight. And as a preview, I'm going to play one of the songs for Zen Buster Music to close out the stream uh, so you guys can uh, chill out with that. This one's called Fading Anxiety. <laughs>